Welcome to the first talk of today's virtual Biasa Research Conference. I'm really pleased to be able to bring you some current aspects of zoo science when we're all working in very challenging conditions. So thank you all for engaging with us today and more generally with the zoo science that we do. My name is Dr Paul Rose and I am the Vice Chair of the Biasa Research Committee and I'm also the Co-Chair of the IUCN Species Survival Commission's Flamingo Specialist Group. And I think it will become clear from my talk today that flamingos are incredibly central to what I do as a scientist. I am a lecturer in animal behaviour at the University of Exeter and I'm a research associate at the Wild Fowler Wetlands Trust. And it's my WWT hat that I'm wearing today because it's through that organisation that I get to help chair the flamingo specialist group. So what I would like to talk to you about is just how much is there to know about one species? And as you'll find out from my talk, I'm actually talking about a group of species, but what I'd like to illustrate is the way in which we can do research on familiar to the zoo species, where we still might have knowledge gaps in our information about them. So the basis for this talk is where does husbandry evidence come from to help us advance animal care? So a brief introduction to what I'm going to talk about. I'd like to give you some ideas on where we fill our knowledge gaps that are useful for the zoo. Where do we fill the knowledge gaps in husbandry and management for the species we keep? I'd then like to talk about why do I specifically investigate flamingos? What is the knowledge gain that we can get from science that involves the pink birds? I'm going to give you an example of how we do that based on setting out key research priorities. So how can we structure a research program to answer particular questions where we know we have sketchy information on what we need to provide the birds with. I'll give you two case studies that are examples of current science that I'm involved in. One that's on the friendships that flamingos have within their flocks and one that's on a very practical aspect of daily flamingo husbandry. How does the feeding schedule of the birds influence some of the behaviours that they perform? Then I will end with a brief uh, explanation of where is all of this science going in the future. Zoos are excellent places to undertake scientific research. And over the past 18 months to two years, we've seen a raft of new papers that have come out that shows the extent, the depth and breadth of scientific output from zoos and aquariums. And most of this has a direct application to developing animal care. So that's really, really nice to see the extent to which the zoo community is investing in gaining knowledge that is really useful to how it keeps its animal populations. And one of the reasons that I really like doing research in the zoo is just how far that can disseminate and how many people can find that research useful. And one of my really nice examples of this is how the husbandry knowledge that we have in the zoo is not only useful to ex situ populations, those in captivity, but also those out in the wild. So husbandry developments for our ex situ animals can directly translate into field conservation initiatives. And I have a reference here from Andrew Greenwood from the mid 1990s. And he talks about the role of the zoo vet in um, the successful conservation of threatened bird species. And this is something very close to my heart because being at the Wild Fauna Wetlands Trust, I have seen firsthand some of their conservation success stories that have been based on research and investigation of husbandry required for bird conservation that is based on ex situ models which have then been applied to the field. So things like the critically endangered Madagascar potchard or spoon-billed sandpiper, those projects would not have been successful without those husbandry models that were used in captive collections then applied to the field. And the more that we undertake zoo animal science that tells us about the way in which we're caring for the animals and allows us to evaluate it and reassess it. So the more we can move away from outdated, potentially not that relevant domestic or agricultural models that are far too generic and probably based around production outputs rather than the outputs that we need the animals to give in the modern zoo, the educational and the conservation outputs of these captive collections. So when we come to think about how do we assess captive care, where can we start? Where can we start to gain 
evidence from. Well, in my head, one of the best places to start is in the wild. Now, I know when it comes to attaining positive welfare and a good quality of life, the performance of natural behaviour is not the be all and end all, but it's a very good place to start. There's an excellent paper by Howell and colleagues that looks at the application of wild ecology knowledge on primates to how we understand primate welfare in captivity. So long as we are aware of what we're doing, of what information we're using, and how that information is being collected, it's an excellent starting point to evidence the way in which these species should be kept in the zoo. That leads me nicely into talking about why flamingos are fabulous. And I'm now going to convince you all as to why they are such amazing animals. So on this slide, I've got examples of the flamingo's natural habitat, as well as the distribution map that shows, beautifully in pink, where you find flamingos around the world. Whilst flamingos are known for existing in really huge flocks, like you can see in the photo of the lesser flamingos at the top of the slide, they're actually very restricted in the areas of the world that you find them. And they're incredibly specialised to a handful of particular wetlands. That makes flamingos really at risk of climatic change and human encroachment. Consequently, there's conservation and educational benefits of the flamingos that we have in the zoo. So the fact that I can talk about flamingos to you today and explain a bit about their habitats means I can use one of my favourite biological words. Flamingos are extremophiles. They are birds evolved to live in incredibly inhospitable, incredibly harsh environments. And I've illustrated that with the two photos at the bottom of the slide. The slide on the bottom left is of Lake Vigoria and one of the hot springs that feeds the lake. And you can see this hot spring is erupting out of, out of the ground. And that water is at near boiling point. So these flamingos have to cope with incredibly high temperatures. The next photo along is of Lake Natron. And you can see that the lake is stained a kind of pinky red colour by the salts in the water and also the algae that the flamingos feed on. And this combination of algae and salts make this a very toxic environment that other animals simply can't live in. And I have an example of just how toxic this environment is. This is a book by a chap called Leslie Brown that was written in the 1950s. And it is an account of his adventures to go and find the breeding and feeding grounds of the lesser flamingos in East Africa. And it contains some amazing black and white photos of this expedition to go and find the birds. It also contains some incredibly horrific descriptions of what happens to the human body when you wade out into one of these caustic soda lakes. Very interesting reading. Now, I'm not suggesting that we create a toxic soda lake that is going to do you horrific harm in the zoo, because that's not going to be good for anybody, especially the zookeepers. But we should think about how we display the flamingos to a zoo's visitors, because that ultimately affects the message that is shown by the birds in captivity. So on this slide, I have an example at top left of some captive Caribbean flamingos in the zoo enclosure, and I have some wild Caribbean flamingos out in the field. And I hope you can see that the zoo enclosure mimics quite beautifully the natural environment. There's very little difference in the type of setup we have between the zoo and the wild. And that really showcases the flamingo's adaptations and how it lives its life. That is one of the rarer examples of a naturalistic flamingo exhibit. We seem to have this viewpoint that the flamingo is this tropical Garden of Eden bird that occurs in this wonderful lush environment where we have lots of green foliage, beautiful planting, manicured lawns and lots of pretty flowers. And this is simply not the case of the types of environments that the flamingo naturally occurs in. Yes, it looks beautiful and yes, it's very appealing to the eye. But if we're going to really explain the message of the flamingo as this extremophile, of this incredibly hardy, wonderfully adapted bird to these remarkable wetlands, we need to remove the beautiful planting, remove the manicured lawn, and think about how we can use a bit of ecologically driven design in the style of our flamingo enclosures to really show off the remarkable environments that they come from. So how do we get this evidence into practice then? How do we understand what we need to do and how do we understand what we don't necessarily know to ensure that our flamingo management is up to scratch. 
So I'm now going to tell you a way in which that we have designed a research program around particular questions that we've needed to answer to further evidence flamingo husbandry. So I said at the start that my talk was about how much is there to know about one species when actually I'm talking about six species and this is the six species of flamingo. So I'm just going to very briefly go through them for you starting at the bottom left. So with the very very bright yellow beak that's the James's or Puna flamingo the South American species very uncommonly seen in captivity and above that bird with another yellow and black beak we have got the Andean flamingo Again, incredibly specialised South American species, not commonly seen in captivity. And those two species together are probably the poorest understood of all of the flamingos. In fact, the James's flamingo was thought to be extinct until the 1950s. We've then got the four species of flamingo that we do see more often in captivity. The Crimson Caribbean flamingo is next. Above that bird, we've got the very small lesser flamingo. Then above me, We've got the greater flamingo, which is the palest and the largest species. And above the greater flamingo, we have got the Chilean flamingo with its distinctive pink joints on grey legs. And it's the Caribbean, greater and Chilean flamingo that we most often see in captivity. So we know there are different flamingo species out there. We know they have these different uh, morphologies, different ways of doing things. And whilst they have ecological differences to them, we can use a broad brush approach of looking at husbandry change that could benefit all of these six species together. So what do I mean by this broad brush approach? Well, it's looking at the flamingos collectively, seeing what we know about them, seeing what we don't know about them, and then trying to answer those questions to fill in those husbandry gaps. And this was published back in 2014 in the International Zoo Yearbook. My colleagues and I, including the current at the time chair of the Flamingo Specialist Group, Rebecca Lee, we reviewed the literature that was available to help advance flamingo welfare knowledge. And we produced a table in this paper that set out questions that we needed to answer to direct research to understand more about the care of flamingos in zoos. So this is that table and I appreciate that it looks quite messy and you probably can't read it properly. So I'm going to break down the core elements of it for you. So starting at the very top, we've got overall positive welfare state. How can we attain knowledge of best practice flamingo husbandry that allows us to give the birds the best quality of life in the zoo? Where does this knowledge of overall positive welfare states come from? And we thought one of the things that we could do was a comparative approach. Can we look at the wild, see what the flamingo is doing in the wild, and then look at captivity and what the flamingo does there. And these comparative approaches is something that you'll find in the scientific literature. And if you're interested to know more, then I would direct you to the work of Georgia Mason, who has some really, really excellent papers on the comparative approach used to further enhance our understanding of animal welfare. So that's our overall gain uh, for this paper. How do we get to that gain? we can split that down by various specific questions, which I've listed here. Could we look at foot health, plumage colour, flock sizes that we keep the birds in, the friendships, the social bonds they have, how do we feed them, the style of enclosure we provide, and how that impacts on things like population sustainability and breeding. We could also look at novel areas of science, such as what do the birds do when their keepers go home? What is their nocturnal activity? And then we could look at some contentious issues, such as flight restraint and the aviary styles that we are building for our flamingos. Does it actually allow a full range of movement in the birds that we're keeping? So by listing these questions, by explaining what the objective is and then what the output of that question might be, we can pick what question we're answering that allows us to then further advance that area of flamingo husbandry. Here are my two example case studies that I've taken from that table. One of them is looking at the social bonds that occur in flamingo flocks, and we've been looking at this over a number of years now. And the other is looking at the impact of a particular type of husbandry, i.e. food provision, on the behaviour that the birds do. And these can be behavioural indicators that we could take forward to look at animal welfare state. So for the flamingo friendships, uh, we know that social networks show the importance of the choice of associate that the flamingo has within its group. 
These birds are very specific in who they'll spend their time with, and they will actively avoid conspecifics within their flocks. So consequently, flamingos need to be provided with a choice to mix non-randomly. And one of the reasons that I performed this research was to provide um, support for the minimum number of birds that we need to keep in a flock. So flamingos have evolved to live in large groups, and therefore they get a benefit from being with many others. And we seem to have shown that in this research. A flamingo social network is obviously a very complex structure and worthy of further investigation. So we should enable this social choice to occur in captivity. This paper also shows that long term data sets are really useful for tracking changes in sociality over time. And social network analysis really lends itself to deeper investigation of why social bonds are important in the zoo. In the 2019 BIOS of Research Conference, we had a whole workshop on social network analysis, and hopefully that showed to any delegates that were there the usefulness and relevance of this methodological uh, way of understanding social relationships to practical animal husbandry. And what is the practical application of this? Well, it tells us who we can move around and who we should move with them. And therefore, we can base our flamingo flock structures on the outputs of network analysis. And again, one of the things that I really like about working at WWT is that flamingo moves that have happened whilst this network analysis has been taking place have been done based on the results of the Flamingo Friendships project. So we can actually use it to inform who we should keep behind in their stable groupings and who are the more social butterfly flamingos that we could move elsewhere. Then with the feeding styles project, we have looked at the more artificial styles of how we feed our flamingos, i.e. in a more restricted area, compared to a more naturalistic setting when the flamingos can forage over a wider period of time. And this was my uh, MSc student, Laura Sewell, who looked at videos of foraging lesser flamingos, and she compared the time spent foraging to the time spent being aggressive. And not only did she find differences between the type of foraging location that the birds were in on the foraging time and the aggression time, but she also found individual differences based on the bird's plumage colour as well. And this showed that individual characteristics of the birds within a social group are influencing the behaviour of others around them. So the practical application of this is really relevant to husbandry. If you feed your flamingos in a more natural setting where they can forage over a wider area, you'll have more time spent foraging and less time spent on aggression. That to me has animal welfare benefits, but it also has potential logistic benefits as well. For example, are you less likely to waste flamingo pellets if you feed it in a wider area when the birds are going to spend more time consuming it and less time squabbling over it? Just a thought there that we could potentially take for further. To finish, where do we go in the future? Of the six species of flamingo, three occur commonly in captivity. One occurs infrequently in captivity, and two are kept by very, very few animal collections. Of these six flamingo species, not all of them have self-sustaining captive populations, yet they're very commonly housed, and they're very popular. So whilst people love them, whilst their husbandry is not that difficult, we still have to advance their population management. And I know there is current work out there by colleagues of mine that are looking into the use of records and how we can use zoo records to understand just what flamingos need to breed more successfully in the zoo. And hopefully that kind of information can be applied into captive care to sort out some of the challenges that we face with these birds and to promote some of the positive aspects of their life in the zoo. So the flamingo is an excellent ambassador for wetland conservation. It's something that is a real vivid example of evolution at a very refined scale. It's a colonial breeder with very specific habitat requirements. It has these amazing pink feathers that have evolved to a range of different social constructs. It can tell zoo visitors a lot about climate change, about the threats to the natural world from human activities. So it's important that we continue to strive with our scientific research into these familiar species because we still have many unanswered questions about them to fully enhance their lives in the zoo. And there are some excellent examples out there of really, really good flamingo care.
I'm very privileged to research these birds at the Royal Family Wetlands Trust and to work with a group of people that implement the outputs of scientific research, like I've talked about with the lesser flamingos, to enhance the bird's quality of life in captivity. I hope you've enjoyed this talk. Thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to know more about some of the pieces of research that I've talked about, you can find them in my reference list. But it's really important to remember that science is only as good as the audience that it reaches. So if you are a student, if you're somebody involved in scientific research, with the permission of whoever you've been working with, work with them to write up and disseminate your research, because ultimately that will be of most benefit to other scientists, but to the animals as well. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jessica Harley from Tato Park. I'm the head of conservation and research at the zoo. Um, thanks to the research committee for putting on this virtual conference. Really delighted to be here with you this morning and to talk to you a bit about animal welfare and zoo events. And I'm going to do that using a case study uh, that looks at the effects of music of a music concert on the behavior of zoo animals. So just to give a summary of what we're going to discuss um, in the next 10 minutes, we're going to give you a little bit of background on zoo events, um, talk to you specifically about music at the zoo and what we know about music at the zoo, uh, look at how um, we developed our evidence-based welfare planning, uh, then uh, our welfare action plan, which is actually part of the Biasa Welfare Toolkit, uh, and I can show you how that was utilized as part of our event welfare planning, then talk to you about our mitigation strategy briefly, and I want to, of course, introduce you to the transect protocol that we use to collect data across the zoo uh, for this uh, study. And then touch upon our approach to analysis. We're currently writing this paper, so not going to give too much away, but just give you an overview of, of how we are analyzing the transect um, protocol. And then some closing remarks. I think most people are quite aware that the main objectives of modern zoos, our zoological collections today, um, is to participate in conservation both in situ and ex situ, provide formal and informal education, and carry out research. Um, of course, central to meeting these objectives is the zoo visitors. So zoos have to actively market to draw in visitor fo football. You want your members to come back time and time again. You want people that have never visited a zoo to come visit a zoo for the first time. So, you know, this may in turn result in zoos adding novel attractions, uh, redevelopments or brand new developments in terms of uh, adding animal exhibits. Um, and of course, carrying out special events. We do special events around the holidays, which are quite familiar to most, whether it be Christmas and Santa comes to the zoo or Easter, Halloween. Um, but we also do other things like zoo lights in the wintertime, uh, which lead to kind of after hours events. We also host music after hour events. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk to you specifically about today. So it might surprise some of you that music's, music's, music has been um, part of zoos for over 100 years. These events date back to early 19th century. Um, European zoos, specifically in Germany, had open air amphitheaters and they also had concert halls. So zoos and music have a very, very long history indeed. And today we see concerts happening in zoos across Australia, Europe, and the United States. Um, 41 years since Oregon Zoo uh, hosted their first summer concert series, and it's still going strong far this year due to COVID-19. And of course, newly established zoos, such as ourselves, um, Tato Park, adopt these similar strategies. We're well aware that they're occurring, and they're an opportunity to certainly bring people that may have never visited your park before or a zoo before. You can get a younger audience and not just a younger audience attached to a young family. So they really can be integral in exposing a new audience to the zoo. So the next step was to look at literature and to find out what was out there, what was available that would help us 
develop our welfare management strategy, what evidence to inform practice was out there. Not a lot is what I found. Uh, there's two papers that was uh, conducted at zoos looking at the effects of music concerts on behavior or physiology of zoo animals. Uh, in the paper by Mead et al., which is the effect of concerts on the behavior of domestic dogs, they did not find any effect. Um, and then in Shepherdson et al., the cross institutional assessment of stress responses, they found um, honey creepers at a Honolulu zoo had increased glucocorticoid secretion, which is the hormone, respress, hormone response to stress uh, post the concert. And the third paper I found looked at a music festival festival that occurred in a Berlin park, and they were looking at behavior and spatial use um, of hedgehogs that lived in, in that park. I won't go into that too much because I don't have a lot of time. But because we didn't have a lot of papers that specifically looked at music concerts, we drew down you know, other publications, um, Visitor, Construction, we looked at uh, the impact of anthropogenic noise to free living um, populations of, of uh, birds and mammals as well. Uh, so that was how we approached getting prepared for the next step um, of the overall welfare management strategy. So after doing the literature review, we moved to the welfare action plan. And I just want to briefly touch upon this action plan because it's part of the Biasa welfare toolkit. Um, and there's so many people that collaborated on putting together the Biaza toolkit, as well as this action plan and the assessment template. Um, we have members that are part of the Animal Welfare Working Group from ZSL, from Peyton, from West Midlands, from Marwell, uh, Bristol, as well as the University of Chester, Exeter, and Winchester. And without all those wonderful individuals, we wouldn't have been able to put together the Biaza Welfare Toolkit, which is really a great uh, resource for welfare assessment at your zoo. And this action plan um, is actually Tato's version, but it's very similar to the one that's in the Biaza toolkit. And I took this um, and used this as my main document uh, to plan a uh, welfare strategy around the FunFest concert. So it lists the species, the issue, the proposed solution, who's responsible, and what kind of priority, low, medium, or high. As you, can, as you can see on the screen, there's three species listed. This is the first page of a very lengthy document because we looked at all the species across the collection. And these were the three that were closest proximity to um, the stage. And within the issue or the proposed solution, we will, if available, cite the evidence basis, or we might refer to research that had been previously conducted that gave us insight to what behavioral changes we might see or things that we might need to put together. And then we identify the issues, come up with the solutions, and then this uh, document was sent to our ethics committee and the zoo working group. And from this, we formulated our list of final mitigations around the concert. So this is a list of some of the mitigations that were carried out. Some occurred before the event happened, some were during the concert event. I'm not gonna go through these because we don't have a lot of a time, um, but uh, I will touch upon the fact that we did close the zoo at 6.30, which was our regular scheduled closing time. And we thought that this was really important. So even though there was an after hours event that was happening adjacent to the zoo, um, we wanted to make sure that the keeper and animal um, protocols didn't change uh, from normal operating uh, summer hours. We also set um, conditional noise limits, both for residents and for the animal enclosures. And I'll talk about that um, in the next slide. So I just wanna give you an overview uh, of the layout and the zoo, and I'm gonna briefly do that by drawing on this slide. So what I've just circled is the concert stage. This is the tiger enclosure, which is closest in proximity to the stage. And this is our bush dog enclosure in the wooded area here that's 723 meters away from the concert stage. We had two fixed points where we were recording sound pressure levels. Um, one was to inform 
the mixing desk and that is located just about here in front of this the staging area um, if the sound pressure levels dba and dbc came within three decibels of the prescribed limits we have prescribed limits um, for within two meters of the animal enclosures um, and we had uh, limits for the residential community and that was part of the licensing so they were set um, so if we got within three decibels, we had a protocol where we could um, radio um, the fixed point, talk to them about what our sound level was. They would in turn look at the sound level that was coming out of their fixed point, and then they would report to the sound mix engineer, which is right here, and they were instructed to turn down the music. So this was discussed prior, obviously, to the concert and and um, they knew that if we got within three, that there was a protocol to turn down. Um, and it worked really, really effectively. It was a great mitigation strategy. Um, we didn't have a lot of evidence basis to kind of set the um, prescribed limits for the animal enclosures. Um, so um, we used some of the data that we had collected from when we were closed, what the D, B, uh, A levels are, and when we're open and during our peak periods as well, when we had a lot of people in the amusement side of the park and we came up with um, our, our set levels. It was 65 dBA and 80 dBC um, for the animals and it was 75 dBA for the residential area, just to give you a reference. Um, they didn't have um, a dBC um, set limit. Uh, and just um, to show you what they look like, so this is a fixed uh, position that was recording continuously during the concert. And so the next step is to talk to you about our transect study. So these are our behavioral observations and how we approached uh, recording the decibel levels at each of the enclosures. So I need to start out by saying thank you to Lewis Roden and Lisa Clifford um, for providing the uh, transect protocol uh, to Tato Park. So this is a modified version from ZSL's sleep transect that they used uh, as part of their monitoring uh, and study uh, around their Zoo Lights event. And it's a wonderful tool that was really useful um, for this concert study. Um, a transect study is basically a unidirectional route around the zoo where you stop at a fixed point and record uh, the behavior using scan sampling and then um, the decibel levels um, A and C. So I briefly want to touch on the study animals and timing of data collection. We were able to collect data on 35 species, 136 individuals. The transects were carried out beginning at noon uh, and ending at uh, 10 o'clock in the evening. Each transect lasted 50 minutes in duration. Uh, so you had 11 data collection points per day per animal. Uh, we carried the uh, data collection out on the weekends. The concert occurred uh, June 28th through 30th, so we wanted our pre and post to be on the weekends because we have slightly different visitor footfall during the week uh, because we still have schools in session at the beginning of June. So we kept it pre uh, and post on weekends uh, in line with the concert. And most of the animals had between 90 and 94 um, observations. You could add a max of 99 uh, observations in total. So to analyze this data, um, we're going to use generalized linear models. We want to determine whether the event itself or its sound levels impact the behavior. So we'll start with uh, fitting them for all the species, and then they'll be followed by separate models to fit um, data for each individual species. And then we'll use just simple Crisco Wallaces to test difference in total visitor numbers. And then we we'll use the same Crisco Wallace to look at mean SPLs, that's the sound pressure levels, the DBA and the DBC. So I'm not gonna give you much of the results because we are working on that presently. So unfortunately, I've gone way over time, apologies. Um, I'll just quickly go through these closing remarks. Um, events are certainly common at duological collections. We host a myriad of different types of events. 
um, from dinosaurs visiting in the summer to zoo lights to concert events. And with that, we've established that there's a pretty long history of music at zoos, but data is lacking on the effects of behavior and physiology. The Bios of Welfare Toolkit has an action plan in it. That action plan was super useful in terms of developing our welfare uh, management strategy around this event and can be easily used um, by other collections to kind of plan any event that they're hosting because there's a, a lack of evidence on any of these events and the effects of behavior. There is a new paper that's just published by Smithsonian uh, that looks at their zoo lights. And of course, ZSL has done a lot of work in that area too, but we still need that publication cycle. We need to churn out these uh, projects that we might be carrying out, but if we can't get them to the masses, they're not that useful. Certainly they're useful to inform how you will approach things as your individual collection, but you know, to make it useful, for our entire community, which is really, really important. Um, evidence can form practice and best practice is where we want to be. Um, the Transact method that we used was really easy to modify. It was reliable when our data loggers didn't work, our cameras didn't work, it worked. Um, staff investment was manageable, it was cost effective. We are using a similar methodology for the C19 lockdown uh, reopening study, which CSL is championing. Um, and our mitigation protocol, we don't know how all the mitigations work because we're still analyzing data, but the mitigation protocol for sound reduction was super effective. And I would definitely um, say to put that in your, your planning and your protocol if you are hosting a music uh, event. So now it's just time to thank some amazing people, the keeping staff at Tato Park. You guys are brilliant. I love you. Rob Craig, Stewart, Education, Rachel and Leah and Animal Management staff, Asher, Superstar. I don't know what I would do without you. Um, and thanks to Lisa Clifford and Lewis Roden at ZSL for providing the uh, Transact and just always being there uh, to support their fellow zoos. Um, thank you. And certainly to Chrissy Stanley at the University of Chester, who's a co-author on this paper and helping me with statistical analysis. Thank you kindly. Uh, I am getting better at R with every day, but still, it's always good to have people that you can work and collaborate with. So thanks very much. And thanks to the research committee, another collaborative force uh, bringing us all together and bringing us this great day of research. Um, across our Biasa collections. Thanks very much. And finally, if there's any questions, please feel free to ask away and anybody can uh, contact me uh, at my email address, which I have added to this slide. Thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us at this virtual Biaza Research Conference. My name is Lewis Rowden, and I'm the Zoo Research Officer for ZSL London and Whipsnade Zoos. And today, uh, my talk is going to be looking at some work about assessing personality in two species of zoo house primate, and then how we've used that information to inform their management. So when we hear the word personality, it would probably be fair to think of it as something that's quite uniquely human. Um, so we see online tests for personality assessment where you answer a series of questions and then get assigned a personality type. Um, and with that idea in mind, it might be quite hard to imagine how this is something that can exist in animals. Um, and indeed, for a long time, uh, the study of animal personality was thought to be too anthropomorphic and didn't carry a lot of weight within the scientific community. Um, but in the last 20 or 30 years, there's been quite an increase in the study of animal personality, and it's been shown to definitely not just be a human concept. Um, and although there are lots of different definitions that exist within the literature, this one by Riel et al summarises the main points well. So when we're talking about animal personality, we're thinking about differences in behaviour of individual animals that are consistent across time and situation. And based on this definition, um, personality has been identified in quite a range of animal taxa, in everything from sea anemones um, up to elephants. And as people who are familiar with animals or spend a lot of time watching animals, we often assign trait labels to them. So we might often think of an animal as being lazy 
or sociable or aggressive and we do this without really thinking about it without giving it much thought so um, the aim of animal personality research is through assessment to quantify personality traits and then ideally learn how to best apply them with the increase in personality research that we've seen over the last 20 or 30 years, there have been previous cases of zoo-based personality work and this application of knowledge tends to come at one of two levels. So it can benefit an individual animal, particularly its welfare. So there are examples with polar bears uh, and personality assessments showing individuals that are more likely to develop uh, self-directed behaviours. Um, in terms of investigating human animal relationships, there's a study that's shown that tigers with certain personalities tend to work better with uh, keepers of certain personalities. Um, and enrichment and training programs have also been shown to be uh, informed by personality assessments. So there's a snow leopard example where they found that a particular snow leopard personalities uh, interact more effectively with the enrichment provision they were given. Um, in terms of social management as well, there's examples where uh, guerrilla groups have been assessed for personality to determine how well they might integrate in certain situations. And then the other level is that personality studies have also been used to benefit population level management through informing conservation breeding. And this has been the case in several species, including rhino, uh, black rhino, cheetah and giant panda. And there have also been multiple studies looking to determine which personality types may be most successful as part of reintroductions or those that might be most affected by adaptation to captivity. So this study aimed to assess personality in two species of zoo house primate. And although primates are well studied and represented in the scientific literature, including that relating to personality, there are still gaps in this field of study that could be benefited by carrying out this project. Um, uh, the species in question are the Siaman gibbon and the Sulawesi crested black macaque, listed on the IUCN as endangered and critically endangered respectively, uh, with both species being managed intensively within the Iaza region through cooperative breeding programs. So the first aim was to see if we could identify personality types through keeper trait rating assessment. And then we wanted to know how this could be applied. So managed breeding programs tend to rely on a coordinated transfer of animals for breeding recommendations in order to meet conservation goals. Obviously, these are very important for zoos. Um, traditionally, they're based on de demographic and genetic information. But this project wanted to see whether information on individual animal personality could be factored into decision making processes. So, for example, could personality assessment improve the breeding success of threatened species, but also ensure that these complicated transfer processes are as evidence based as possible? So both to make sure that it's an efficient use of resources, but more importantly, to ensure that moves are done with welfare consideration as well. And then lastly, for the macaques specifically, um, this population had previously been assessed in 2009 for personality. Um, so this allowed an opportunity to test whether individuals had personality that was stable over time. Collection of the personality data was achieved through distributing the hominoid personality questionnaire to all institutions that participated in the two species EEP programs. So the questionnaire itself has a list of 60 personality traits covering how an animal is in relation to conspecifics as well as to people. And familiar keepers were then asked to score each animal for these traits on a one to seven scale. One means there's a total absence of this trait and seven is that the animal displays the trait extremely frequently. Ideally, more than one keeper would score each animal for each trait, which would then allow for testing of reliability. Um, so unlike the macaques, the siamang or any given species have not yet used this questionnaire in literature. Therefore, we needed to validate it for this species. Um, so to do this, I collected a range of behavioural coding data covering um, state behaviours, proximity to conspecifics and event behaviours. And then these were run through a general linear mix model alongside the personality scores that were achieved through the questionnaire data to validate the questionnaire itself. So 
to test for agreement between raters for the traits of the individual animals, uh, intra-class correlation coefficient analysis was used. And then the results of these indicated which traits were reliable. And these were grouped into personality domains by principal component analysis. I used a general linear model to test for the relationship between personality domain scores and reproductive success. And just for the macaques looking at the stability question, I used Kendall's tail correlation to investigate the correlation between the 2009 and 2018 scores for individuals that were assessed in both conditions. So in terms of results for the Siamang, uh, we received responses to the questionnaire from 24 institutions, which is 50% of the EEP participants, and this gave us ratings for 77 individual animals. So the traits after going through interclass correlation, 35 of them were shown to be reliably rated by keepers, and the principal component analysis grouped these into three personality domains. And the general linear mixed model uh, results for the validation showed that it had good reliability with the behavioural coding data. So in terms of the personality domains for the Siamang, it, like I say, grouped it into three. And these were excitability, which scored highly for traits such as thoughtless, clumsy, uh, social with people, defiant, disorganised, playful. Dominance, which scored highly for persistent, decisive, aggressive, dominant, and a negative scoring for vulnerable. And introverted, which had highly scoring traits for things like uh, cautious around people, erratic, um, anxious, fearful, and solitary. So in terms of results for Siamang reproductive success, these plots show the relationships between the three personality domains and scores for reproductive success in 20 females and 18 males. So we have red lines and dots showing excitability, blue showing dominance, and green showing introverted. And although it might visually seem that there are some trends appearing, we actually didn't find any significant relationship between the personality types and reproductive success. In females, however, we found that uh, age had a significant effect on reproductive success, so younger females bred more successfully. And in males, we found that the number of breeding transfers had a significant positive relationship with uh, reproductive success. So although we didn't find anything clearly significant with the personality scores, in the females we saw that excitability domain score had a negative effect on reproductive success that approaches significance at 0.056. And results for the Sulawesi macaques in terms of personality stability, we found that 26 animals have been surveyed in both the 2009 and 2018 conditions, and that there were four individual personality traits that were featured in both of those times. And these were dominant, playful, active, and lazy. And the Kendall's tail showed that actually only one of those, the dominant trait, had a significant correlation at 0.018. So to discuss the results that we have so far, one of the main things to say is that it was possible to identify personality types in each of these two species. And also that the trait rating questionnaire, when completed by familiar keeping staff, proved a reliable measure of personality. So this will be really useful for a model tool for future application. And in terms of the Siamang and reproductive success, although we didn't find any significant relationship between personality and breeding success, it might be that by increasing the sample size, we will get a more accurate idea of what is going on, especially considering that some of the domain scores, such as excitability, appear to be approaching significance in the females. And perhaps more biologically relevant, um, it, Considering this is a monogamous species, it might be more important to consider dyad personality scores as a combination of the two animals rather than separately as individuals. But one of the other things is that it sh this investigation using studbook data has shown the importance of other factors, such as number of transports in this sort of work. The fact that we didn't see long-term stability in all four of the traits for macaques might initially seem like a theoretical issue when we consider the definition that was used at the start of the presentation. However, further investigation of the literature shows us that there are varying timescales that relate to personality stability, depending on things such as longevity of the species or how relevant the traits are in terms of evolutionary advantage. 
So considering the fact that the gap between the two study conditions is close to the mean age of macaques in this population, it's likely that the animals involved will have been influenced by lots of environmental and social changes, meaning that the perception at least of personality could have changed. So work to develop this project is ongoing and we have a collaboration on a project to assess global zoo gibbon personality in relation to welfare, as well as how macaque personality may relate to the success of breeding transfers and introductions. Um, and the plan to analyse historic studbook data for Siamang reproductive success shows the value of these long-term data sets. And there have also been requests from other primate EEPs to carry out similar work in their programmes. So really the take home message is that it seems we're able to incorporate these personality assessments into our conservation programmes and this way we will make sure they are they continue to be evidence based and welfare minded. So I'd just like to thank uh, Dr. Kathy Baker, who's been my main supervisor throughout, as well as uh, Dr. Joanna Newbolt, um, also to the EEP coordinators for the species, Dr. Holly Farmer and Tony Dobbs, as well, of course, to all participating institutions and keepers without whom this research would not have been possible. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, there are some references, uh, particularly for the studies I referenced earlier, and please feel free to get in touch with any questions. Thank you. Today we will be talking about the collaborative conservation research on Sicilian amphibians undertaken by ZSL London Zoo and the Natural History Museum London. Sicilians are an ancient order of amphibians. Whilst most people are familiar with frogs and salamanders, very few will have heard of a Sicilian. Sicilians are legless amphibians and there are over 200 described species. The majority of species are fossorial and as a result, they are extremely poorly known and they've been rarely encountered during routine herpetological surveys. They have a pan-tropical distribution and are notice noticeably absent from Australasia and Madagascar. Uh, we don't know the conservation status of 65% of Sicilian species, and therefore there are huge gaps in our ability to prioritise species uh, for conservation. And it's essential that, that these gaps in our knowledge are addressed. We do know that some particular assemblages of Sicilians are extremely threatened. Those, for example, in the Seychelles are range restricted, and they're also evolutionarily distinct and globally endangered, and therefore global priorities for conservation. Despite their appearance, Sicilians are absolutely fascinating. They're the only vertebrates with retractable tentacles, and many have reduced eyes and are therefore reliant on chemical cues. Their skulls are heavily ossified and ideally adapted to a fossorial lifestyle. The reproductive biology is of wider interest to evolutionary bio biologists. Some species give birth to live young, and the females may be gravid for up to six months. The young have specialised fetal teeth and they scrape away a lipid rich substance secreted in the oviduct. In aquatic species, they may also have uh, fetal gills. The haemoglobin of the young has a greater affinity for oxygen than the gravid female, and these gills are extremely important in gaseous exchange. Other species have aquatic larval stage stages and others lay eggs that they subsequently guard. Once these hatch, they can be altricial or more precocial young and in some altricial species, the female develops a thick and fatty skin and the young use specialised teeth to periodically tear off this skin for sustenance. Sicilians have been largely ignored by zoos. Only six species are maintained according to Zims, and most of these species are aquatic. Uh, a box of soil is not of much interest to the visiting public or zookeepers for that matter, and it's been difficult to make husbandry advances. Amphibians are thought to be the most threatened vertebrate class. Nearly half of species are threatened with extinction, and amphibian conservation breeding programmes are one of the tools that have been suggested to act as the last line of defence for amphibian species that would otherwise be unlikely to survive in nature. The establishment of such, um, of such programmes can be really problematic for groups or species that we know nothing about. I first started working with Sicilians in 2006, and it was apparent that for even the most commonly kept species, there were very little data available. Captive husbandry should be informed by data collected from the field, and I was fortunate enough to work in Colombia and collected field data, mainly water parameters, 
and obtained longitudinal data sets on water temperatures from local government. These um, regimes were then implemented at Jersey Zoo, where I was working at the time, and this resulted in the first captive breeding of, this, of the target species at this institution. These results were then uh, disseminated. In 2012, ZSL began a formal partnership with the Natural History Museum in collaboration with Mark Wilkinson and David Gower, two globally renowned Sicilian researchers. Maintain, when maintaining a known number of Sicilians in a defined space offers opportunities to study these animals that do not exist otherwise. Um, it provides opportunities to make new discoveries about life history, behaviour, reproductive biology. It gives the opportunity to trial and validate methods that can be subsequently used in the field and also opportunities to investigate and develop treatments for disease. We have two dedicated offshow rooms which are climate controlled and custom made enclosures for Sicilians with very uh, well fitting lids and um, a sloped um, bottom of the tank to allow for humidity gradients. Uh, we also have a viewing window so the public can see um, the facility and the keepers working within it. Much of the stock was donated by the Natural History Museum. The animals have been legally collected from Cameroon and French Guyana and none of the species we worked with are currently thought to be threatened. Over the course of the project we have maintained eight species of Sicilian, some successfully and some less so. Many amphibians are threatened by emerging infectious disease. Uh, chytridiomycosis. This is caused by the amphibian chytrid fungi BD and B cell. These infectious um, diseases have been implicated in the declines of over 500 amphibian species globally. At the time we began our collaborative research it was not known if Sicilians were susceptible to these um, pathogens and the amphibian conservation community had identified this as a major blind spot. We imported an African species of Sicilian which developed lesions during the quarantine period several individuals sub subsequently died and the histopathology confirmed the first case of lethal chytridiomycosis in a Sicilian amphibian. In the wider body of work we found that BD positive animals existed in Africa in the wild but um, Sicilians were negative for this pathogen in Asia and the near tropics. BD infects the keratinized skin of amphibians and we wanted to know where on the amphibian uh, would we be most likely to detect BD in the case of Sicilians? And so we swabbed different parts of the Sicilians and found that in positive individuals, BD was most readily detected on the back and the head of the Sicilian, which is totally different to what you would experience in a frog or a salamander. We then developed revised um, protocols for swabbing, and these were shared with researchers in South and Southeast Asia and actively taught on our MSc courses on wildlife health and wildlife biology. As well as showing that BD infection and associated lethal chytridiomycosis occurred in captive Sicilians, the team showed through a survey of wild animals of nearly 20 species from Africa and the Neotropics that BD infection was present in wild Sicilians. This was established for African species already, but had never been detected in the Neotropics despite previous surveys. This is important, as it established BD as a potential disease threat to wild neotropical Sicilians. Diseases are especially worrying and difficult to survey taxa, as populations can disappear due to a panzootic arriving without this being easy to detect. In the same work, a treatment protocol for aquatic Sicilians was developed to clear them from BD using itraconazole, an antifungal drug, but without requiring sterilization of biological filters and therefore preserving good water quality throughout treatment. This is not only a key tool for working with Sicilians in captivity, but was then used to develop a similar treatment for critically endangered Mexican ambistomatid salamanders also at ZSL, which we published last year. Groundbreaking work in Sicilians therefore underpinned success in other amphibian taxa. Captive husbandry relies to a great extent on meticulously replicating the wild habitat of amphibians in captivity. However, often this is not completely possible. For example, the exact substrate found in wild habitats may not be available outside of range. Substitutes must be developed, and these need to be readily available and easy to use. In these circumstances, the responses of animals can be used to inform husbandry. We used this approach in two species of Sicilian, 
Geotrapetes from Africa, and Microcecilia from South America, to inform the use of substrates for these animals using choice chambers, which you can see in the bottom left of the screen. We presented the animals with choices between two substrates, commonly used for the respective species in captivity, while controlling for other variables, and showed clear preferences of each species for particular substrates. These data could then be incorporated into husbandry and disseminated to other people working with the animals. The Sicilian work at ZSL goes beyond what happens with ZSL staff and direct collaborators only, and has proven a useful resource for wider collaboration and training. We developed ERs a best practice husbandry guidelines for Tiflinected Sicilians using a collaborative approach, working with museums, zoos, aquaria and private keepers in Europe and the USA in order to capture a diverse range of experience with these species and develop the best possible husbandry guidelines. The Sicilian facility and the expertise developed in ZSL staff using this resource have also played a key role in field conservation initiatives, especially through the EDGE programme. Two EDGE fellows, Marcel Talacoete and Basil Luella, who worked on Sicilians, have been trained on handling and disease surveillance techniques in our Sicilian facility. This training continued into the field with ZSL staff developing field survey protocols with the EDGE fellows for Gala Sicilians in Kenya and with Ben supervising a master's student contributing to this project. In this way, the captive facility has been directly engaged in capacity building, which is much needed for Sicilian conservation projects. One thing that is quite apparent when looking at many Sicilian taxa is that individuals of one species look very alike. Aside from the few species with distinct patterning, individual identification is problematic and limits many avenues of research and captivity in the field, where knowing about individuals is really important. Artificial marking techniques are poorly trialled in Sicilians, and some established methods are rather brutal, for example branding and tattooing, with little understanding of their impacts on welfare and survivorship. Others are not viable due to the limbless fossorial nature of Sicilians, Using the Sicilian collection at ZSL London Zoo, we have begun trialling relatively non-invasive marking techniques that are established for other amphibians, including visible implant elastomers. We've shown that in one species of Sicilian, Herpelisqualostoma, which you can see in the pictures here, VIE is moderately successful with short-term retention of around six months, but it's not viable for longer-term marking. The marks are simply lost. In another species, the excitingly named Micro Cecilia unicolor, VIE was completely unsuccessful, with the implantation of the mark itself being impossible. These methods which we published are useful to monitor individuals in captivity, so we can track health and other things, but also have the potential to inform fieldwork for research, including mark and recapture studies that are crucial to underpin monitoring in the wild. Dissemination of failures is as important as talking about successes, especially in a field where so few data are available. We have successfully bred three species of Sicilian at ZSL, Tiflinectis compressicorda, Geotrapetes seraphini and Potomatiflus calpi since 2012, but these successes were not fine-tuned replicatable events and much work is left to do to develop breeding protocols. We have also learned a great deal from where things have gone wrong and we feel that it is critical not to sweep this under the rug. Working with pathologist colleagues, we have also comprehensively reviewed mortalities in the collection, along with available diagnostic data to bring together common problems and areas that require further investigation in Sicilian health and captive husbandry. We would like to thank all of our collaborators and also herpetology section team members who have made this work possible and we will be available to answer any questions or respond to discussion points after this presentation. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Hello everyone, I'm Ricardo. I'm a PhD student at University of Birmingham and today I will be talking a little bit about my ongoing research project on how to enable wild-type behaviors in zoo parrots.
Let's start with the Enclosure Design Tool, which is a web application created by the University of Birmingham and Partners. The idea is to help captive facilities comparing the behavior of their animals with their wild counterparts. You collect behavioral data on captive animals, you upload those data into the EDT, and the EDT uh, returns something like this on the right. So it returns a comparison of the data you collected with the available data on wild individuals. Then based on the behaviors that are found missing or underrepresented in the captive individuals, the EDT provides recommendations on what to improve in the enclosure in order to encourage those specific behaviors. The ADT is already up and running for great apes, and the next step is to create an extension for parrots. And that's where my project comes in. Now let's talk parrots. And by parrots, I mean all birds of the order of Cetaceiformes, which include budgerigars, cockatoos, macaws, all those popular species that we so easily recognize. They are very popular in human care, and over 60,000 individuals were found on record in Zins in 2018. Over 25% of all parrot species were found to be threatened, and the main threats are, as usual, habitat loss, but also the illegal pet trade. Parrots are so popular that they are often captured from the wild to be sold in the illegal pet trade. Parrots are also cognitively advanced and have large neuron densities in their brain, in the wild, they live in complex environments where they have to travel long distance and then to different sites for different activities. And in captivity, they often develop undesirable behaviors like stereotypes, feather picking, which are likely indicators of poor welfare. Captive breathing can be a lifeline for all those threatened parrot species. Like I said, parrots are common in captivity and they're often managed as part of insurance populations that can be and are being used in reintroduction programs. So these captive parrots can be used to boost wild populations or to reestablish wild populations. It was found that out of all vertebrates that got their threat status downgraded, 25% benefited from captive breeding programs. So captive breeding programs can no doubt play a big role in conservation. However, Long-term captivity may cause loss and modification of natural behaviors, it may cause morphology changes, and if this is left unchecked, the success of reintroduction programs may be jeopardized, because we'll be keeping in human care um, animals that are no longer true representatives of their wild counterparts. So why do we want to encourage natural behaviors in captive parrots? On one hand, we want to increase the conservation potential of captive animals, we want to maintain their natural repertoire of behaviors and we want to keep them as morphologically similar to their wild counterparts as possible because we want to facilitate any potential future reintroduction and or release programs. On the other hand, we also want to enhance their welfare. Captive animals must be given the opportunity to express natural behaviors and they should be provided with physical and psychological stimuli as they would experience in the wild. Of course, this should result in improved welfare, but there are other important factors that influence the welfare of captive animals. We are not highlighting them because they fall outside of the scope of the study, but of course they're also very important. Moving on to methods and starting with the zoo partners, which you can find at the bottom of the slide. This study has two main partners, which are Wildlife Reserve Singapore and more specifically Jurong Bird Park and Drayton Manor theme park and zoo. Both these zoos have been very supportive of this study and they're very keen on learning more about their animals and how to improve their enclosures and how to enhance the welfare of their parrots. So it's been fantastic to have them as, as partners. In terms of species, there are three main species in this study. The scarlet macaws from South and Central America, the African grey parrots and the swift parrot from Australia. Scarlet macaws and African grey parrots are common in captivity um, and in zoos, and that's why they, the main reason why they were brought into this study, because it was a nice starting point for the EDT. Um, the African grey parrot is also endangered in the wild. The scarlet macaw is not globally threatened, but some of its populations are threatened. The swift parrot, on the other hand, is not common in zoos, but it is critically endangered. And because the situation in the wild is uh, so severe, uh, these species was brought into this study so we can learn as much as we can about them in captivity and help boosting the captive population for future reintroduction. 
So in terms of methodology, I'm using three different protocols which overlap with each other. In all of them, I collect data on general behaviors and enclosure use, and then in each one of them, I co further collect specific data. In the cognition protocol, I collect the type of manipulation and the object and food categories that the parrots interact with. In the locomotion protocol, I collect data on the type of locomotion, the, how much they fly around the enclosure, and also the support categories they use within the enclosure. In the social protocol, I collect data on how they socialize uh, with each other and proximity scans, so how close or not they are with each other in the enclosure. So let's start with the activity budgets on the results section and let's look first at graph A on the left. You Here you can see the activity budgets of all five captive scarlet macaws and to the right of the line you can see activity budgets on wild living individuals, data from the literature. One of the bars is on captive bred released scarlet macaws, the other one is on juvenile wild scarlet macaws. Of course, this is not ideal for comparison. However, unfortunately, I haven't yet found activity budgets on wild adult scarlet macaws. And this is the best possible alternative that I could find. And it's here for cautious comparison. Looking now at the graph B, you can see the activity budgets of both Drayton's and Jurong's gray parrots groups. And to the right uh, of the vertical line, you can see activity budgets from the literature on yellow fronted parrots, Poicephalus flavifrons, which is a closely related species uh, to the African grey parrot. The standout from these, these graphs is that all the captive parrots spend most of their time perching or inactive, and they spend a higher proportion perching than their wild counterparts. Also, the captive individuals spend less time feeding, which is this blue, uh, than their wild counterparts, and they spend less time socializing, the light green, than their wild counterparts. So these were the standouts of the activity budgets. Regarding enclosure use, here are some examples to highlight some of the potential problems found. So the main problem is the uneven use of the enclosure. All parrots showed a clear preference for one section of the enclosure, while other sections were barely used. Also, if you look at uh, Scarlet Tree on the top left corner, you will notice that it spent most of the time on the ground, on section C, the bottom of the enclosure, which is not very normal for Scarlet Macaws. Also, most uh, of the parrots uh, did not spend a lot of time at the top of the enclosure, so the vertical use of the enclosure may not be fully optimized either. Let's now talk about manipulation, and let's start with food manipulation on the left. As you can see, uh, often was not possible to see what they were eating, and that's why the unknown black bar is quite visible on the graph. However, when it was possible to see, basic and intermediate food manipulation were the most common ones. Advanced, more challenging manipulation was quite rare across individuals, with the exception of one of the macaws. Moving to object manipulation on the right, you see something quite similar. Basic and intermediate manipulation are predominant. Advanced manipulation is virtually non-existent in any of the parrots. Also, most of the objects the parrots interacted with were permanent, meaning they were not novel or temporary, and they were mostly easily destructible, so they were not very tough or challenging at all. Food use. Starting with food manipulation on the left, you can see that mouth only, the darker green, was predominant in all of the parrots. The use of um, both mouth and foot, the light uh, grey, uh, can be seen in two of the macaws, uh, but it was still not predominant. In the object manipulation here on the right, you can see something similar. Mouth only was predominant across all individuals, and there's the use of both uh, in Jerome's grey parrots, in two of the macaws a little bit, but still not predominant at all. Looking at locomotion and support use, and starting with flight rates here on the left, these numbers on top of the bars represent the total uh, hours of observations, and the bars represent number of flights per hour. As you can see, it did not exceed 10 flights per hour in any of the individuals. In two of them, of course, uh, we did not record any flights, and in uh, all of them, you can see that most of the flights observed 
or under 6 meters, so short flights really. Support use here on the right, you can see that wire mesh, the darker green, was seen in all of the individuals in a fair amount. Um, in the, out of the individuals that used perch, stable perch, the lighter green, was the most common across them. And ground was also very used by one of the macaws and a little bit used by two others. In terms of type of locomotion, tripod locomotion, which is climbing, descending, was the most common, but it was mostly seen on the wire mesh. Walking was also a common type of locomotion, and all of the parrots mostly used horizontal and thick perches. Let's look now at the social side of things. And like I said before, social behaviors were not very frequent in any of the parrots. Um, nonetheless, alloprining was the most common type of social interaction across all scarlet macaws. Nibbling was the most common in Jurong's grey parrots, and both alloprening and nibbling were most common in Drayton's grey parrots. Looking at the proportion of the group within 2 meters, Scarlet 1 and Scarlet 3 spent a considerable amount of time on their own, so with no individuals within 2 meters, but all the others seem to spend a larger proportion of time with at least a portion of the group within 2 meters. Close proximity, though, is another story. Only one of the macaws spent most of its time with at least one individual within a wing length. All others spent most of their time in with no close proximity to other individuals. So, moving on to the discussion, what can be improved? First of all, we want to increase activity levels because inactivity was high across all parrots, and it may be a sign of negative states, uh, it may be that they have no motivation, to do other behaviors, it may be an alternative response to stereotypic behavior. We also want to maximize enclosure use because the full space is poorly utilized and we want to use it as much as possible. We want to decrease ground use because both species are arboreal in the wild. Yes, wild grey parrots are taught to forage on the ground, but it is not predominant. They still spend most of the time on the trees. We want to increase the use of the top of the enclosure because in the wild, both species prefer the safety of the tree canopy. They like to be high up because that's where they're safer from predators. We also want to increase manipulation challenges. We did not observe a lot of challenging or advanced manipulation. And in the wild, they need to use their cognitive abilities and build strength to manipulate and open fruit and seeds. And therefore, we want to encourage that in captivity as well. We want to increase novelty and toughness of objects provided as enrichment, and we want to increase food use. In the wild, parrots frequently use their feet to manipulate food. For example, the grey-headed parrot, which is another Poicephalus species, and therefore closely related to the grey parrot, they use their feet in 53 to 100% of feeding observations which is a much higher proportion than what was observed in the present study. We want to encourage flight as well. In the wild, scarlet macaws and grey parrots are taught to travel between 10, 15, 20 kilometers respectively in the morning alone, just from roosting to foraging sites. We want to decrease wire mesh use because even though climbing is a natural behavior, the wire mesh is a very homogeneous and challenging stable structure that does not offer the challenges uh, of the supports that they use in the wild. We want to increase the diversity of perches they use because we don't want them to just be using the thick, horizontal, stable perch. We want a greater diversity of supports in thickness, orientation, stability, which resembles a bit more what they experience in the wild. And finally, we want to strengthen social bonding. Uh, we found that they don't interact a lot we found that they don't spend a lot of time in close proximity, and this may be due to issues like sex ratio, incompatibility between individuals, hand rearing. There are several uh, possibilities, but there's something we want to focus on as well. And to give you an idea of what stage I'm on in my PhD, I've already done part of the baseline data collection. I analyzed those data, identified some of the problems, and proposed modification to the zoos. I still have to complete these steps for some of the species. Then I will go back to both zoos to collect data after the modifications have been applied. I will have to analyze those data and then I will conclude if the proposed modifications worked or not and if the behavior of the captive parrots is closer to their wild counterparts or not. 
And then ultimately, which may take some time, what we want is to create an EDT extension for parrots. And to finalize, we found several things to improve. We proposed modifications to the zoos and we found several exciting opportunities to naturalize the behavior of zoo parrots. Remember, this is an ongoing research project, so please stay tuned for future updates. And here is my email. If you have any questions or any comments about my project, feel free to email me at any time. Thank you very, very much for watching. Hi everybody, welcome to my talk as part of the virtual Biasa Research Conference. My name is Dr Sonia Hill, I'm from the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Chester and I'm a co-opted member of the Biasa Research Committee. And I'm going to talk to you today about a relatively poorly understood behaviour known as regurgitation and reingestion. Regurgitation and reingestion, or R&R, &R, refers to the voluntary, seemingly effortless behaviour. And it's not to be confused with vomiting, even though it can look quite similar to this, as these two photos perhaps illustrate for you. Regurgitation then refers to the voluntary retrograde movement of food from the esophagus or the stomach to the mouth, hand or floor. And it occurs in the absence of any apparent retching or nausea, as far as we can tell from observations of the animals. And it tends to occur shortly after the animal has finished eating or drinking or even midway through a meal. But in contrast, vomiting is um, an autonomic activity. It uh, occurs involuntarily, it's reflex behavior, and it's typically preceded by things like hypersalivation, abdominal muscle contractions, retching and nausea, all of which are absent from regurgitation. And vomiting usually occurs with some delay after the animal has eaten. Reingestion occurs subsequently if the animal takes back in the regurgitant and masticates and consumes it. And the overall behaviour of R&R &R can actually be quite subtle. So those photos I showed before were more obvious, of course, but sometimes it can manifest itself as a bit of a hiccup or a burp. And it can be quite easily missed, especially to people who um, aren't used to, to observing this behaviour. It can also be a case sometimes of blink and you miss it. It can occur very quickly, especially these more subtle forms of the behaviour. We know that uh, this behaviour is relatively common in zoo housed great apes. And we know from previous research that it occurs in at least some individuals across nearly all of the zoo housed species of great apes. Chimpanzees, orangutans, western lowland gorillas, about whom probably the majority of the work has been done, and bonobos. Although we do have to be cautious with the definition that has been used for bonobos because it does include hand assisted vomiting, which is a self induced behaviour. And so that obviously wouldn't fit with the classic definition of R&R. &R. We know from those previous studies that there are a range of possible factors affecting R&R, &R, so it's multifactorial, uh, but these studies are often based on small sample sizes, so there's a lot we have yet to learn about these behaviours. There are um, some feeding related factors that seem to be involved, at least in some cases, relating to nutritional quality of the food and also um, the animal's opportunities to feed. So, for example, increasing the amount of fibre in the diet and reducing the amount of sugar can have a positive impact on the animal's behaviour um, and also increasing the availability of food. So linking into something called the continuous feeding hypothesis, whereby um, whilst food is ubiquitously available in the wild, in managed settings, that isn't always the case. And perhaps in order to create the opportunity to feed, the animals have to artificially create their food by regurgitating. Some studies have also shown perhaps an effective time of day or season. Also, social factors might be at play and medical factors as well. We know that there's a similar behaviour to R&R &R in people called rumination disorder, although that is a bit of a misleading term because 
we as great apes do not have a rumen, and um, so it isn't true rumination. But this is the name that the disorder is given. And in people, it is classed as a feeding and eating disorder. And part of the diagnosis for it is that it wouldn't be linked to any other medical condition such as acid reflux. So in an ideal world, we would be able to rule out these other medical conditions for the non-human great apes that engage in R&R. But I'm sure you can imagine the challenges that that would bring, including things like invasive um, endoscopy procedures and so on. So I apologise in advance if this puts you off your next meal, but what does the regurgitant taste like? And this is actually quite important in our understanding of why animals might do this behaviour. So in humans, it has been reported that it tastes quite similar to the original food, at least the first few times that the person regurgitates that particular item. And we also know in human infants that ruminate that they appear to gain satisfaction from it. And so we can assume that the taste or the feeling isn't unpleasant, at least in people, and it may even be self-stimulating. So we have to consider that there's the possibility of positive reinforcement in this behaviour. And we do know that some non-human great apes sometimes eat uh, other animals regurgitant, even if the individual doing the re, uh, doing the reingestion has never actually regurgitated before. So they might not be a regurgitator themselves, but they might ingest the regurgitant of others. So again, we can assume from this that it doesn't taste unpleasant. Otherwise, you wouldn't choose to, to eat that food. So why should we be worried about R&R in great apes if it doesn't appear to taste unpleasant or feel unpleasant? Well, we are not true ruminants. We have no rumen as great apes and um, we all have monogastric stomachs. And so therefore R&R is not part of the normal feeding mechanism for great apes. We also know there are no reports to date of R&R occurring in free living wild apes um, or in wild born sanctuary apes. So it appears at least to date to be a zoo behaviour. We could, of course, potentially expect that one day we might see R&R in these other settings if conditions are in any way um, suboptimal in ways perhaps that we don't yet understand. We also know in humans that um, do rumination disorder that uh, people self-report uh, that they do this behaviour when they're feeling perhaps anxious or bored. So um, we have to bear that in mind, of course, when dealing with the great apes that do it in zoos. There are um, some transitional or pre-regurgitate behaviours that can occur prior to the onset of regurgitation. Um, and we know this occurs in at least some individual gorillas and perhaps other great apes as well. And these occur immediately prior to regurgitating and they continue until regurgitation is achieved. These behaviours can include things like a repetitive sweeping, um, similar looking to a kind of foraging motion, can also include things like uh, rubbing the stomach or drumming on the stomach, uh, running a piece of straw or wood wool through the fingers in a repetitive manner, repeatedly tipping the head downwards towards the ground and sticking the bum up in the air, um, or head wiggling and various other transitional behaviours as well. And we also know in humans, um, these kinds of idiosyncratic behaviour patterns are also part of the autism spectrum. And in people um, that do this behaviour, we um, know that it's also linked to self-stimulation and also can be a precursor to uh, self-injurious behaviours. So we need to really consider this carefully when dealing with the non-human great apes as well, in case these also apply. It's been well documented that there can be clinical consequences uh, of the oral acid in people with rumination disorder. And also, sadly, we know that in human infants, it can also be fatal due to malnutrition and uh, dehydration. In the non-human great apes, we know that the regurgitant is 
more acidic, significantly more acidic than the original food that was ingested, at least uh, for gorillas that regurgitate, based on some previous work that I've done and published in the journal Animal Welfare in 2009. And we know that this wasn't a consequence of acidic saliva, uh, because I was also able to measure the pH of the saliva and confirm that that was alkaline. So we need to consider that there could well be clinical consequences in the non-human great apes. That said, there are no published reports of clinical consequences resulting from the oral acid in uh, great apes that engage in r, &R. but there are anecdotal reports of problems. And so clearly uh, there's a lot more that we need to do in this area and further investigation is still ongoing into this behaviour involving myself and other colleagues as well. And the more we can learn and understand about this behaviour, we'll be able to provide the best possible care for zoo housed great apes. And we'll also hopefully be able to um, reduce the likelihood of animals developing this behaviour in the future, but also reducing and eliminating this behaviour from the repertoires of animals in whom this behaviour has already developed. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to hearing some of your questions uh, on the chat that we're about to have now. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for joining this virtual conference today. I'm Bridget, I, I run the research and conservation programmes at Nodesley and I'm also a member of the Biosa Research Committee. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how at Nodesley we ensure that the research that we're doing in the zoo uh, is also beneficial for our field conservation programmes when possible. And we're going to use a case study of camels to show you how we do that. So I'm sure you're all aware there's uh, two common species of camels, so the dromedary camels with one hump and then Bactrian camels with two humps and that's what we hold at Nosley. So they're a domestic species, uh, there's over two million of them worldwide, originally they were from Central Asia but like I said they're now found globally and they're very familiar, um, everybody I'm sure is very used to seeing them in collections. There is also uh, a second species of two hump camel, and this is the wild camel. So it's critically endangered and there are less than a thousand of them left in the wild. They're found in the Gobi Desert, so in China and in Mongolia, and they're threatened by hunting, drought, mining and hybridisation. And they're a completely separate species to the two humped camels that we have in zoos, so the Bactrian camels. It was used to be thought that they were sort of a feral population, but the genetics shows that they are actually a completely separate species. And given they're a critically endangered species, they're a species in need of a lot of conservation action. So we're involved um, in a broad program centres around a captive breeding centre of these wild camels, uh, which is located where the black dot is in the uh, buffer zone of the Great Gobi Special Protected Area A, which is the last remaining stronghold for the species in Mongolia. And the breeding centre holds uh, over 30 captive wild camels. It's the only captive population in the world. So all of the camels that you see in zoos are the domestic variety. And the camels are kept in an 80 hectare enclosure, uh, which is basically just a fence around their natural habitat. And they're released in the summer for grazing. So the role of this population is really the key question. Is it an arc population? or um, you know, in case of potential disaster hitting the wild population, or is it more than that? Is it a source population for potential future conservation translocation projects? It's not really possible to determine this role without considering the wider conservation management plan for the species. But currently, there just isn't enough information to make a really robust evidence-based conservation management plan. So there's a group of partners, uh, which is led by the Wild Camel Protection Foundation, and a PhD student who are aiming to gather enough data to develop a long-term strategy for the species. And those that they have a number of roles in this project, they're all centred on captive management because obviously that is our expertise, that's what we can offer for this project. And uh, we do focus on veterinary support and what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today, which is behaviour. So I'm sure you're possibly thinking that's beneficial um, 
So there's virtually no literature available on the behaviour of the wild camels. And when making decisions about captive management, it's really useful to understand the behaviour of the species and uh, kind of apply that to management decisions. So we need to undertake some data collection to get some baseline data. Now, as you can imagine, collecting data in the Gobi Desert is logistically challenging. It's very far away. It's very expensive. It's very tough conditions to work in. So when we're there, which is for generally three, maybe a maximum of six weeks a year, we really need to make the absolute most of the time that we've got there. So we're able to use the camels that we have at Nosley to um, test our methods, test our ethograms, uh, train researchers. And this is beneficial for us for being more efficient when we get out in the field. But it's also really beneficial for the camels at Nosley because the more we understand their behaviour, the more we can improve their captive management too. And hopefully this would then also apply to um, camels kept in zoological collections in general. Now, we do have to be really clear, there are lots of differences between Nosley and the Gobi. So not least, you know, it's technically a different species that we're recording. But for trials, it's really valuable and it makes sure that we are making the absolute most of our time in the field. And it kind of gives us an idea of what we might expect to see from a different camelid species. So last year we had a master's student, Joe, uh, from MMU, who used a draft ethogram that we put together when we were out in the field for the first time to observe the domestic camels that we've got at Nosley. And one of his main findings was that he saw significant differences in the frequency of human influence behaviour in the camels that were born at Nosley and raised at Nosley versus camels that were born in zoos and then brought to Nosley when they were older. So when we talk about human influence behaviour, what we mean is things like uh, approaching vehicles or approaching keepers or using vehicles as scratching posts, which is what you can see um on the picture and this isn't ideal okay we don't want to encourage this kind of behavior um first of all but uh, um mostly you know we want to keep the animals as wild as possible we have a very hands-off management approach but we also don't want to encourage accidental damage to visitor vehicles so the knowledge that um their upbringing significantly impacts their future behaviour, really helps us decide how to raise our animals, but also helps us decide which animals to bring into the collection from other collections. And this idea of being influenced by human behaviour is also really interesting when it comes to the wild camels. So as we said, the uh, wild camels are threatened by illegal hunting. And anecdotally, the wild camels that are still in the wild are really very shy of humans. This is a male running away from the researchers in uh, September 2018 in the special protected area. So they, you know, their human influence behaviour is not to approach animals, uh, humans, sorry, it's to run away from them. But this doesn't appear to be the case at the breeding centre. Now you can see from these pictures how confident the camels are around people and that's people that they're familiar with. So the picture on the left, um, one of their herders and then a group of people but then the picture on the right is me. They're not that familiar with me, but they're very, very confident. Now, the pilot data collection that we did at the breeding centre so far does back this up. So in that other category, we see a higher percentage um, of behaviour from the wild camels at the breeding centre than we do in the captive camels at Nosley. And other um, included a number of categories, but predominantly it was human influence behaviour. So if we consider that this is a population that may be involved in conservation translocations in the future for a species that is at risk of illegal hunting, uh, a tendency to approach humans is a really bad trait. And of course, the problem does have to be approached from the other side as well in that the illegal hunting issue has to be tackled too. Um, you wouldn't release animals back into an area where there was still a high risk of that. But the pilot data collection did show some really good indications as well. So that increase, that higher level of alert behaviour or alarm behaviour is really, really positive for a species that might be released. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is why are the camels at the breeding centre so confident with people? And it appears to at least be related to the supplementary winter feeding routine. 
The camels are fed very predictably by the same people in the same place at the same time most days. So we see a lot of anticipatory waiting behaviour. And even if the camels aren't waiting, as soon as the, the herders arrive, they would approach them for food. The one location for food did result in anecdotal observations of competition between the camels for food, with smaller or younger or weaker camels being excluded. And Joe's research at Nosley, we can see here that the subadult, the young camels, spent a lot more time feeding than the adult camels did. So although a direct comparison wouldn't be entirely fair, it's worth considering that this might be something that would naturally happen in the wild camels, but they're not able to do because they're all competing for food in the same area and the young camels are being um, excluded. So it definitely merits further research on our part. We also identified that other species uh, were able to access the enclosure and were suffering because of this one food location. Uh, so this is a carcass of a goitic gazelle that was found very close to the food point and its cause of death was determined to be a kick in the head from a camel, uh, presumably because it was competing for the hay that the camels also wanted. So although we're still waiting to collect more robust data um, about the camel behaviour at the breeding centre, and we're still working out how to try and remove this association with people and food, uh, the competition issues that we identified were, um, they pointed to a really, really simple intervention. So we installed hay racks um, and we installed them at the original feeding location, but we also installed them um, in different points around the enclosure, which gave the camels the ability to have a choice about where they fed. Um, they could feed in small groups, the small young camels could feed away from the older, more dominant camels, um, bigger camels, and overall um, competition was reduced. And we also encouraged the herders to make changes to their routine as well, so feed at different times of the day, um, to not always necessarily fill every single hay rack so the camels kind of had to look for the food um, so that's more natural behaviour than knowing exactly where your food's going to be every single day and overall it would reduce the anticipatory waiting behaviour in that one spot. So the next steps um, we want to be doing some data collection to evidence the effectiveness of the hay racks to get more baseline data on the uh, camels at the breeding centre because like I said this is only um, a pilot based on the more extensive work that we did at Nosley um, and we're also in the process of tagging the camels for a completely different purpose so we're tagging them so that they can be um, more easily identified and the stub books a bit more robust in terms of breeding um, breeding records, but also then having that individual identification will allow us to do behavioural research on a social level as well, so understand how the herd interacts in social units. Um, we went to be doing that in April, but coronavirus kind of put pay to that for now, uh, but it is something that we're going to be doing in the future. Um, so Overall, um, I hope this has given you a really brief introduction into one way that research in zoos helps um, conservation in the field. So the idea of trialling the methods, looking at patterns that we see in the domestic camels and then looking to see if that was also a problem in the wild camels and what the impacts of the behaviours that have been exhibited might have on the long term plans for that population. Um, so that's it from me. Um, thank you very much for listening. I, I really must highlight that we work with a really, really wide range of partners, in-country partners and across the world on this project. And it wouldn't be able to happen without them. Um, but hopefully uh, by us all bringing our various expertise to the project, we're working to create a future for these species in the wild. And thank you very much for listening. Uh, my contact details are there and we're doing questions um, after the talk. Thank you. Hi um, everyone, um, my name's Lou Bell. I work at University Centre MyScot um, and I'm on the research committee. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you this uh, afternoon about camera traps and whether we can use them within the zoo environment uh, for observing elusive shy animals, nocturnal animals, animals that we don't always see. Um, and of course, enjoying the love and life pictures that we have of incidents, uh, including my uh, old favorite student, Conga here.
Traditionally, camera traps have been used for observing wild animals. Um, here we have a picture of a lovely brown hyena. Uh, baboons, one of the best and most entertaining, shall we say. Um, black and white rhino, being able to observe the rhinos from the ears um, and their, their horns and so on, and also for security to make sure they're still there. An elephant family, being able to see who's about and who's where, who's mixing and hanging around with others. The ultimate an African leopard. Um, a lot of projects in the wild will use camera traps to ID animals, so they'll have two camera traps um, positioned in opposite directions, so when the animal walks through they can ID the left and the right palage. And then also uh, lots of lovely things like the old uh, giraffe here taking a walk through the evening. Um, using camera traps it gives us a great opportunity to be monitor um, really rare behaviour like this. Um, this was a young bull in uh, one of my Africa trips again, um, but just to kind of give you an example of what can be achieved by using this data, um, here he is inspecting some elephant bones, something that you probably wouldn't be as privileged to see uh, within the daytime. Um, or you, if you are, you're exceptionally lucky. Um, and it gives us an idea to see actual insight into the really discreet and rare behaviours that uh, some animals would do within the zoo. The cameras are there. Um, students, for undergraduate projects, it's great to be able to use um, camera chats, but you do have to bear in mind students will be students. This is actually me, I'm blaming students, but this is me setting the camera trap. So you can see it's 32 degrees, you can have a look at the moon phase there. But these are kind of images that you need to watch out for. Um, six foot six students helping, trying to set camera traps up is great. Their angle of height, potentially positioned in the tree, you have to think about what you can see, how you can see it. Of course, we always love a Mooney and student. Um, yeah, this book will be all over the UK now, which and, and Europe, because we've got a lot of international uh, students and zoo staff attending today. And of course, like you know, everybody loves a joker. So it's funny, you have some funny moments, but also you have to bear in mind, like this is using battery camera. It's really important um, when we're looking at using camera traps to consider if this is a useful method for uh, zoo data collection. I honestly think it is. It's not easy by any means, but I think it can give us a real opportunity to collect an immense amount of data with minimal disturbance, if you will. Um, there's very few, if any, published uh, papers. I trolled for about three, four hours across relevant uh, search sites um, to see if there's any papers that solely use camera trap data. Um, the only one I could find was this one from London Zoo, which is using uh, data from wild and captive animals to be able to see um, is it useful for conservation. Um, the one on the left was a review study. There's lots of papers using lots of wild data, uh, but minimal on um, captive stuff. There was a really awesome talk uh, by Dr. Kathy Baker and Dave Rich from Wild Planet Trust at the um, Beaza Mammal Working Group back in um, October last year at Whipsnade, where they hand reared an Alston civet, quite a rare, lovely little charismatic uh, mammal, um, and they used camera traps to collect data on this little animal to see how uh, how she changed her behaviour in the night, uh, where she occupied, how much time she spent in each area of the enclosure, and so on. So, a real useful study there to help. Um, with observing an animal. Things you need to consider um, when you're observing animals via camera traps is most definitely the position and angle of your camera. This is a lovely picture of lots of beautiful grades of, uh, blades of grass. Three and a half thousand times later, the novelty is wearing off, uh, so it's something to think about. Um, the researcher, uh, we all think we're good at stuff. I've used camera traps so many times, um, <clears throat> but often make mistakes. Uh, often under the pressure of being in an enclosure where you've got you've got to get in and get out quick uh, for one of not disturbing the animals or being a nuisance to the visitors or whatever, you can often forget to switch the camera on. Um, you can have a trigger where it takes 12 shots and then it takes a picture. Uh, and can you stick around for that, that kind of stuff. Uh, you're relying on zoo staff. Now, it's a, an amazing thing that we have these opportunities, but to be, have to access an enclosure every day to take the SD card, to download the data gets a little bit time consuming. Um, and plus all health and safety protocols, risk assessments, all of this stuff. Uh, your equipment, um, depending on the amount of quality, the amount you pay for your camera trap, varies on your quality. Um, have you got enough SD cards, having a spare set of batteries to make it easier for the zoo staff should they be like downloading this for you. An external hard drive is the best thing you'll buy. You don't want to be a nuisance in any way and you want to make sure that if the zoo are helping you, all of this stuff is there. 
definitely need to consider environmental factors. So position comes in here with weather. If it's windy, your camera might move. Um, if it might pick up substrate, if it's raining, your lens might get uh, spatters of water, so it makes it hard to see. Uh, if it's bright sunlight, then you, you, you'll just get a blurred picture. Um, and temperatures, your cam cameras can work on minus 20 and right up to 40 plus if you've got a decent one. So it's just something to think about. It'll change your battery life as well. So target species, thinking about what you're trying to observe. This was a, a camera trap picture set up at a waterhole, again in the, in the bush, but just to kind of show you the, the relevance within zoos. If we were looking at um, giraffe, this would be amazing because we can see a giraffe and we could see a like, predator interference here with a, probably a lion on the giraffe's tail. But if we wanted to look at zebra, for example, we're at the right angle, we're at the right height, and there is zebra pictures which do, the zebras walk past so you can then ID um, I do the animals. Uh, think about who it is that's watching, uh, who's involved. So this is that exact same camera trap. Date for a bit of tea. So This is a cat of some sort. As you can see from the whiskers, look at that eye, who's been and interfered with my camera. Um, thought it was brilliant. I was like, yes, we're going to have, we think it's a lion. It's quite small but with a position of the ears. Thinking, yes, we'll be able to get some awesome shots. Went back the next day um, and we managed to get these shots. So position now has changed massively. Here we have an aerial giraffe, which is brilliant. Um, yeah, we had endless pictures of birds flying over, but that was literally it. Um, went back again the next day, so we swapped the SD cards. Went back the next day, the camera trap's gone. God, hyena, we found a tiny piece of, of plastic. So if this was in a zoo environment, you obviously have to think about the danger animals. So what do you see? Um, here we have a, a video of aardvarks. This is from one of my student studies uh, year before last, just trampling over. So it's being able to ID the animals, being able to see what everybody's doing. Location and position is very, very important. Um, and then if you look at this one here, we can see there we have we can ID the aardvark based on ears and the body shape and so on. But if you're looking at small mammals, it'd be quite tricky to be able to ID uh, the animal that's there. Um, yep, yeah. and lots of nose pictures. Aardvarks love anything new. So we've done all sorts. Leave the camera in, don't interfere, leave it continuously recording. Obviously, you have to have keeper permission because it's going to be filming them. Um, if the minute you go in and touch it, the aardvarks are inspecting it. So you've got to be sensible and you've got to be prepared with batteries and also be sure that it's going to work properly. But you're not supposed to see <laughs> three times in zoos. This is where the zoos have collected the camera for me um, and left it switched on in the brute in their office. You can get the GDPR, you need permission to show them. Uh, what you hope to see, humping aardvarks, this is phenomenal. As far as we know, just from talking to other aardvark keepers, nobody has ever seen aardvarks mate. This is not probably the right way, as you can see, it's back to front, um, so he's not going to have much success there. But then hopefully, da-da, victory. Uh, the date's reset, but the time was right. So you can pick point different times of day to see um, what your animals are getting up. So to have a quick look at some data, uh, we've had a couple of students collect, well, three students actually collect data on the aardvark at Blackpool Zoo over the last four or five years uh, using camera traps. Um, in this study here in 2018-19, collected 24 nocturnal shifts of 12 hour uh, data, so from 6 p.m. till 6 a.m. in the morning, uh, collecting up to three and a half thousand pictures per aardvark should it have been triggered every five minute interval. Um, percentage of the 12 hour period of data collected was 54% observed. This doesn't necessarily mean the cameras um, and same for being triggered. It doesn't necessarily mean the cameras um, kind of missed all of that behavior. It can mean the animals inactive. So the animals not triggered it, not moved it, not set it off. Lots of different things to think about, but it's quite good for looking at accuracy. Um, and then this year, my student Katie, she did the same study, but we've well, it's not the same. She did a similar study, collected 20 hours of data, but with diurnal and nocturnal behaviour, with observations live in the day and camera trap data at night, um, using the same sampling, so five hours, over four hours in the day, four hours in the night, sorry, five minutes. And um, we had 100% success in diurnal, which is obvious because she's observing the animals and she can move to where the animals are in the enclosure, but with in the evening was 65%. And another 
I've covered up down here at the bottom. So there it said 36 percent trigger rate in the evening data. Again, is that because it's missed the aardvark? Is that because it can't see where the aardvark is? Is the, is the camera too high as the aardvark's knocked it so it's not in its usual position? Have the batteries ran out? As the, is the SD card full? Has it not set off full stop? Um, there's many things to think about, but a 36 percent success success rate, if you will, with the cameras there. Um, and this, my student called Jack this year did a study on the Arctic fox at Wild Discovery using the camera trap. Again, this uh, fox had only just arrived. So when it was first allowed access to his enclosure, um, he was watched for seven days. Again, using diurnal and nocturnal observations um, and five minute sampling. Um, so you'd expect the camera to trigger every five minutes. If it doesn't, if it just triggers, you only look at the the nearest to that five minute interval pictures or video, depending how you've set it up. Uh, diurnal data was 46% observed, so uh, the other 64% was out of sight. And when we compare that to nocturnal, this drops to 26%. So basically, if we're looking at using cameras to observe Arctic foxes, are we going to be getting a full re repertoire of their behaviour with, again, a 36% trigger rate, which was quite interesting. Um, and inactive behaviour, when that's recorded, as you can see, the animal and you know the animal's asleep and resting no, it's not a sight or it hasn't been triggered looking at horses they're just on stripy zebras if we're looking at it like that one of our msc students sue has just finished a study watching horses by camera traps um amazing 49 and a half thousand pictures sue's looked at which is insane um, she must be seeing horses in a sleep excuse the pun 23 days per horse um, only 19 for three animals because of covid she had to finish her ops using nocturnal data, 12 hour shifts on the uh, actual sampling. 89% of the session data was recorded as active. That's where she could see the horse, whether it was sleeping, re uh, resting, walking, feeding, and so on. Um, again, in a stable, it's a smaller environment and it, it can be easier to position your cameras because uh, you've got a lot of height, you've got a lot of support to hang your cameras. So potentially it's thinking about what animals you're using and your enclosure size. Um, and 12 percent of the observations was lying. So it's been really good for Sue to be able to do that, apart from the 23 days where the camera didn't work, um, which was quite sad because she's run quite a lot away to come and mend. But just to kind of get you thinking a bit about whether camera traps can be used, you've got to think about the animals. You've got to think about the location, the access, permissions, GDPR. If you've got people on there and you're not supposed to have people on there, all this kind of stuff. But look, you can get some lovely pictures. These are all of Sue's little horses sleeping. Try to squeeze as many on. You can, you know, moon phase, temperature. There's an amazing amount of information that we don't get specifically in the nocturnal night part of the zoo hours. Oh, little sleepy horses. So... Um, moving forward, it's just a quick introduction talk today, but we definitely need to look at studies. I'm really interested in driving this forward. So if anybody is out there interested in trying to collect data, I really want to establish the efficacy of using camera traps. So I'd like to observe animals at the same time as the camera trap recording and have a look at the percentage of observed locomotion in both settings, for example, to see how reliable they are. Um, thinking about kind of different camera types, different camera angles, uh, different speeds, different shutter speeds, different amount of video recordings and so on across the range of, of taxa. Trying to think about if we use aardvark in different collections. So thinking about the same species observed across three or four collections, it'd be great to do all of this. So if anyone can help get trap in, equipment obviously and cost. So just some acknowledgements um, to finish off here. Um, special thanks to Katie, uh, who watched the aardvarks this year for many, many hours. To Jack, who watched the Arctic Fox footage, um, Sue, who did the 49,500 and the rest pictures of the uh, sleeping horses. Um, this is Charlotte, our equine assistant head, um, who's helped greatly trying to get the project up and off the ground. The collections involved, Blackpool Zoo for the Aardvarks, Wild Discovery for the Arctic Fox, and of course, uh, uh, my skull for using the horses on the livery. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending my talk today. My name is Elena and I am currently a PhD student at Queen's University Belfast. Prior to taking on this PhD, I was the tertiary education program leader at RZSS. And in that role, I coordinated many research projects ranging from animal behavior to nutrition to zoo visitor studies. And although my background is animal behavior, 
Over the years, I got more and more interested in the visitor behaviors and their feelings interactions with their animals. So hence the PhD idea was created. Before I get started with the talk, some of you may have seen Paul do a post about this survey that I've been using in the study. If you had a chance to take the survey before this talk, thank you very much. I appreciate your help. If you haven't taken it yet, don't worry. We can do a mini version right now and then discuss it during the Q&A. So if you wish to take part, um, just do so in the comments section and answer the following questions. Gender and age, pretty self-explanatory. Um, zoo staff or volunteer, past or present, so that's any zoo experience um, that you've had, yes or no. What does it mean to you to feel connected with an animal? So like a definition there. Now the next bit, I want you to think back to the last time you visited a zoo or aquarium and tell me your favorite and most connected to animal of that day. This may be the same one, or it may be a different one, depending on how you felt that day. Okay, so while you're doing that, um, I'll just give you a bit of an overview of the talk today. So the PhD is still in early days, so I'm just going to give you a bit of a, a background to study one, the methodology that I'm using to help answer the research questions, and a depiction of some of the preliminary data and the next steps that will be undertaken in this specific project. So there are many reasons why I want to tackle the PhD in this topic area. As part of the education team at RZSS, we learned a lot about behaviour change in conferences and what are the best ways to promote this. One of the key aspects for me was always about engaging people emotionally to the cause and creating a connection with animals and their stories. I think that anthropomorphism is definitely one way that we can help people engage and connect with animals. So as such, one of my first visitor studies involved anthropomorphism. Very tough to say. The study was all about people's tendencies to anthropomorphize zoo animals and the way we studied this was by listening to and categorizing types of comments that people were making at and the enclosures. We looked at how much people anthropomorphize different species and what factors may be influencing this. We examined things like evolutionary closeness, familiarity, animal behaviors, proximity, enclosures types, lots of different things. Some of the results of this showed that people were more likely to anthropomorphize primates um, and familial animals such as penguins. So this was quite interesting. Now, the word connect itself is um, used really widely in the zoo community. And in fact, it was in the mission statement of RZSS to connect people with nature and safeguard species from extinction. Oh, sorry, safeguard threatened species. We keep changing it. They kept changing it. Um, but it's not just RZSS, WAZA as well. Um, promote programs that um, allow people to connect with nature. So connect is definitely a very popular word in the zoo community. Now, it's not just me that has noticed the word connect is used a lot in the zoo world these days. Patrick and Kaplo did a study in 2018 of AZA mission statements and found that 16% of them were now using the word connect. And when they used it, they were referring to inspiring and promoting a connection with nature in their visitors. Now, a similar concept to um, connection with animals is empathy. And there's a, a large group of zoos in America that have set up a project called MECAP, and they are working to create, assess and promote programs that enhance empathy with wildlife. Now, in order to do that, they created a definition for what it means to have empathy with animals, which is quite a good definition. It says empathy is a stimulated emotional state that relies on the ability to perceive, understand and care about the experiences or perspectives of another person or animal. Quite a long definition but quite an interesting concept and probably something that we will borrow from for our definition of connectedness. And there has been direct research into connectedness itself. It's been studied by various researchers directly. Clayton in 2009 found when people reported a higher sense of connection to animals, they also reported a stronger desire to help the animals and that species. And in 2013, Skibbons and Powell developed the Conservation Caring Scale, which can be used as a measure of species-specific connection, which I am using in my survey. And Hal et al. began to um, find themes in what zoo visitors to Melbourne Zoo um, felt um, it meant to feel connected to animals. So there definitely is a growing area of research um, behind this and is involved in the feelings of connectedness. So my aims for this study is to create a working definition for the term animal connectedness and to determine what factors influence people's feelings of animal connectedness. To tackle these aims, I have four main objectives, which I will run through quite quickly. 
The first is to see what visitors feel it means to have a connection with animals, which animals they have this connection with, how much and why. Secondly, I'll examine if things like animal behavior, activity and proximity affect the level of connection. Thirdly, we'll look at if existing connection to wildlife, perceived welfare and species specific connections play a role in how connected people feel. These three items in bold are existing Likert type scales that have been used in previous research. Now, finally, I'll determine if our favorite animals and our least favorite animals um, and our most connected and least connected animals, if there's any kind of relationship between those two. But we have a very limited amount of time today, so we'll only be discussing objective one and four. Right. So we're using a mixed method approach to look at these research objectives. We have created an online survey in Qualtrics that has both open-ended and closed type questions. The participants have to recall their most recent visit to a zoo or aquarium, ask the survey questions. Um, it's been shared on various social media. It's a, on a website called Survey Swap and another one called Survey Circle. And I'm currently contacting zoos and aquariums to um, ask if they will help with the distribution um, of the survey. Now we will specifically look at um, objectives one and four and how we'll be kind of answering these questions, what methodology we'll be using. Um, in order to look at objective one, this is going to be pretty straightforward. We're asking to provide a definition of what it means to feel connected, just like I asked you at the beginning. And they'll also have to state which animal they felt most connected to. And then for the how bit, um, I'm using this image that you see here. Now, this is a scale that's widely used in social psychology to measure connectedness to others. And it's also been used by Bernay et al. in 2008 to study connectedness to nature. So it is a, a proven scale that is helpful in studying connectedness. So we're going to be using it in our study as well. As for the why question, um, there are 16 different options that people can choose as to why they felt connected. And obviously one of them is other that I haven't thought of. Um, so there's lots of different reasons why people feel connected. I don't want to give them as much opportunity to answer as possible. These will then be categorized into um, four different areas of reasons, which we'll look at um, in future. And objective four is, again, pretty straightforward. We're just asking for uh, what's their favorite and least favorite animal and their most connected and least connected animal. And then we'll look at those um, statistically. So, right, what do we have so far? So as of the 15th of June, we had 201 participants with a mean age of 35. A large proportion of those were females and had visited a zoo. The location of the zoo visited is shown on the map here, with 39% of the visits occurring in the UK zoos, 34% in EU zoos, and smaller proportions visiting zoos in other areas of the world. Now, the people that answered had some had zoo experience and some didn't. 60% of the people did not have experience working or volunteering in a zoo, but 40% did. So that is just some of the kind of the basic demographics of our participants that we've got so far. So oh, let's now start to look at which were the favourites and most connected to animals. No big surprises here for the favourites. We do love our charismatic megafauna and in general we do feel quite connected with them too. Overall, according to a chi-square tests, primates, carnivores and hoofstock were significantly more likely to be chosen um, than the other taxa. So what does this look like species-wise before it gets condensed into categories? These word clouds depict the species listed by the participants, with larger, bolder words being chosen more often. So you can see things like penguin, elephant, orangutan. Yep, they're our favourites, but they're also our most connected as well. So does that mean that our most connected is going to be our favourite animal? Let's have a look at that a little bit closer now. So we did a binomial test to find out if our favourite animals were our most connected to animals. And the results showed that the number of people whose favorite animal was also their most connected to animal did not differ significantly from the number of people whose favorite was not their most connected to animal. And that's very difficult to say. So basically that says, so is there a match? If I choose penguin as my favorite, is it also going to be my most connected? And the answer is not necessarily. So for example, when I went to Belfast Zoo to get ideas for my studies, I found my favorite animal was the Barbary lions, but my most connected to animal was the maned wolf. And the, the data shows this as well. So there's no significant link between what your favorite animal is and your most connected to animal. As for the least favorites and least connected to animals, we are again seeing certain species being chosen more often with reptiles, fish, and vertebrates being significantly more likely to be chosen as our leasts. 
However, when people wrote their least, they were far less specific on the, the species. Again, these words, word clouds show the words that were actually written by the participants. And similarly, when it comes to our least connected and least favored animals, these appear to be, there appears to be no significant link between what our least favorites and our least connected are. So again, when I visited Belfast Zoo, I found that my least favorite was a chicken and my least connected was a tarantula. And unfortunately, I can't recall the exact species for either of these <laughs> either. So next, was there a difference between the connection level and the species type? Now, in order to look at this statistically, I needed to group some more categories together to get a more equal sample per group. So I had to group together reptiles, fish and invertebrates. But hopefully, as I get more data, I might be able to pull these back apart. Um, now, when we look at the mean level of connectedness per group, there was no significant difference um, between the means. So in other words, if you felt connected to a crocodile, on average, you felt the same level of connection as to someone else who felt connected to a penguin. Now, I think this is a, a pretty cool preliminary finding and I'm excited to see, excited to see what happens um, when I start to get a larger sample size. As for the why question, um, people were given a variety of options to tick. These options will then, like I said, be categorized into these four different categories that you see on um, the screen there. Now, prior to doing this online, I had started collecting data at Explorers Aquarium on site and I surveyed 66 participants before the COVID restrictions came in. So I did have a chance to actually play with a bit of their data on the whys they felt connected. Um, so I do have a bit of information about that. So out of those 66 participants, I found that 36% uh, were offering reasons that were personal based experiences. And these were things like the animal evoked emotions in me. 25% were animal focused, so this would be things like the animal looked at me. 23% um, were enclosure or site specific reasons, so the staff was great, the enclosure was great, the information on the signage was great, that kind of thing. And 16% of those reasons um, were down to social driven reasons, so things like my group members reactions evoked emotions in me, and that's why I felt connected. And it's quite interesting this bit, and I'm very interested in kind of exploring that further in the social side of things and how people are relating to each other while they're connecting with the animals. Now, this is the moment you've all been waiting for. So what does it mean to feel connected to an animal? Now go back and look at what you wrote and see if it is similar to what we have here. I'm gonna show you some examples of what people have said in their, um, in their surveys. Here are some definitions from some people with no zoo experience. I quite like the first one. Um, now here we have some comments from people with zoo experience. And so far we have 195 comments to look at, so it's quite a few. So what we plan to do is look at all these comments and to analyze them using a qualitative approach called thematic analysis. Now, how it all did this in 2019 with 85 visitors to Melbourne Zoo, and these were the themes that they emerged in their study. I'll most likely be looking for similar themes, but I think I've spotted a few others too. So based on all I've read in literature and what I've seen so far in the data, what do I think animal connectedness means? This is the definition I have so far, but don't quote me on it. So animal connectedness can be defined as one's perceived sense of closeness, commonality, and empathy with an animal. So yeah, so that's what we have so far. So there's one other side I wanted to show you. I know I've run out of time, but I wanted to show you. Um, so staying connected during COVID. In addition to my main survey, I was also curious to find out if people stayed connected to zoos and aquariums during the COVID restrictions. I found that 60% of people that took the survey did stay connected in some way. Um, I asked them to say which zoo they stayed connected with. As you can see, Biazza zoos are kind of heavily featuring heavily in the in the word cloud. And I also wanted to know how they stay connected. So they had different options that they could choose from, ranging from visiting the website, using education resources, using the webcams, social media, donated to feed. I thought that was great. 20% of those people have donated to help feed the animals. Um, other was an interesting one because people who chose other quite often said that they um, knew a person who worked in a zoo and that's how they were staying connected. So 60% of the people were staying connected with zoos and aquariums during the, the COVID restrictions. So I thought that was really good news to see. So overall, I want to say thank you for, for listening to the talk. My next steps are pretty straightforward. Get more data, analyze more data and design the next study. 
Um, but you guys can help me with step one. Um, as you saw, people are staying connected through social media. So please do share my survey link with friends, family, colleagues, and anyone else you know in the zoo aquarium world. The link is here on the Biaza Research Committee page and also on my Twitter account. We now have 261 participants, but we're aiming for 500. So every little bit helps. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer questions. Hi, my name is Chris Sturdy. I'm a lecturer at Eastern College in Norfolk. I'm also a member of the Biaza Research Committee, where I'm the research liaison for the Aquarium Working Group. So today I just wanted to spend a little bit of time, first of all, just very quickly introducing the Aquarium Working Group and moving forward where our focus is going to be within research. Uh, review some examples of research that's been completed by public aquariums. So before we can highlight what our priorities are going to be, we need to have a bit of an understanding of the research that's already been done and the areas that we're looking at. And hopefully by doing this, uh, you'll see why aquariums are actually really important for aquatic research. That it's not just a case there for a, a great day out, uh, but obviously we've got this impact on conservation research as well. And then I just want to finish off by uh, going through the research priorities that we've chosen, uh, where we feel that as a UK public aquarium sector, we need to concentrate some of our efforts on and just finalising by how the aquarium working group can actually support uh, collections for achieving this. So the mission of the BRs of Aquarium Working Group is to provide support and coordination between zoos and aquariums to ensure a sustainable aquarium sector. So sustainability is quite important these days and certainly we want to make sure that as a sector that we're achieving that. And one of the objectives specifically the involve, involves research is that we want to develop this cross institution research opportunities, conservation programs and awareness campaigns that are open to all to join. So we're creating this collaborative approach. Uh, we don't want any barriers there to get in to the research. So let's just go through a quick snapshot of uh, some of the projects that have already been achieved or been working on at the moment uh, that involved aquariums. So one of the, the big projects at the moment is the SNAP project, which is the Sustainable Aquariums project. And this is a collaborative uh, work between Bank University, The Deep, Sea Life and ZSL. Now, for those who know a bit about uh, breeding fish or fish cycles, uh, it can actually be really complex and we've got some really easy species that uh, can that produce life young uh, produce eggs that are easy to hatch but actually for a lot of species there's larval stages involved and when we look at the key reef species and we have this broadcast spawning approach uh, we're going to have larval fish development uh, which also requires a microscopic uh, food to feed these microscopic larvae and so at the moment it's quite a challenge uh, to to complete the full breeding cycle and we find that we still need to look at collecting some animals from the wild obviously done in the most sustainable way possible and moving to forward as an industry we want to really close that loop and one of the projects that say is doing that is SNAP, where they're involving public aquariums uh, to look at sampling their, their displays. Uh, they've got fish in there, they're probably going to be breeding, they are breeding, we could, we've seen that now, uh, and collecting water samples where they're then uh, finding larval stages of fish within there. These are being sent to Bangor, uh, where they're then raising these larval stages. They're looking into the technologies, the approaches, the methods to complete this life cycle. And they've successfully done this now with a number of species. So the benefits of doing this, not only are we going to successfully be able to breed uh, fish within aquariums and be self-sufficient on species, but this is also going to help support to restocking of uh, reefs and other environments, which is going to be uh, very important in times ahead. If we do a quick uh, review of the aquarium uh, related uh, publications within general zoo and aquarium research. Again, we see here that we've got ones based on corals done by the Hornham Museum, uh, where they've done some great work uh, 
reproducing all the the spawning parameters within captivity so they can produce synchronized spawning events so when it's happening out in the world uh, it will happen exactly the same time uh, within london not only does this give us some fascinating insights into corals and their breeding activities but it also means that we can control uh, the breeding uh, um, environment and we can produce corals that are going to further support the repopulation of reefs out in the wild. We've got projects as well that's looking at again the reproduction of uh, species so looking at our elasmobranch populations, our sharks, our rays and how can we best manage those populations within, uh, camp within captive environments. Uh, so again we can look at learning about the behaviours, the environmental triggers uh, the best way of managing these animals within uh, our displays and then once we've got those young how we can um, give them the full support to get to a mature stage and then when, once we've got these uh, we need to understand the, the the DNA diversity the genetics of the, the animals so we can assure that we're having informed breeding choices moving ahead we can produce those stud books those monitoring programs and make sure we have the best diversity within our collections uh, for the for the best conditions for the animals uh, and moving forward I've also had some uh, studies done within uh, looking at behavior and social networks this is quite an understudied area at the moment. Uh, we've got this publication by the Wild Planet Trust and also the Deeps worked on uh, some projects as well uh, with their undergraduate students there looking at um, social uh, behaviours uh, within mixed species uh, exhibits during feeding time and who gets uh, the sort of the priority is it shared feeding just trying to understand what's going on there. So understanding a lot more about behaviour is going to become really important to make us have these informed husbandry choices so we can better improve uh, our feeding and our maintenance schedules. Other projects that have been going on at the moment as well is Dr Mike Sweet from the University of Derby has been doing some great uh, work with public aquariums uh, looking at mycobacterium uh, which does affect um, populations how can we treat that uh, and also eDNA testing uh, so they, they've done this uh, with, with ZSL uh, can they effectively uh, test the environmental DNA of species such as Greek killifish uh, and so this will help surveying populations about having to take invasive approaches if we look at sea life as well, uh, they've got a, a massive list of, of publications that they were happy to share with me. Uh, so you get a bit of an idea of the, the species that have been studied there. So again, majority of the work being done on elasmobranchs and seals. Uh, and we've got disease reviews that have been done with the International Zoo Veterinary Group. Again, reproduction management, looking at breeding technologies, genetic assessments, but also some environmental impacts there of microplastics. Uh, they've discovered some species and really at the moment one of the important aspects is cyanide fishing which is uh, still uh, a method of fishing that happens it's illegal but people still do it and this has devastating effects on habitats and the individual animals so they've put a lot of research and time and money into looking at how can we test uh, for cyanide poisoning within fish and really try and track down uh, what's been going on uh, there and so we can stop that that element of the trade so that obviously loads of research has been done but it just gives you a really quick idea as to, to what's uh, what's happened and by looking through this this has quite given us a, an idea as to where we want to, to move forward so as I said at the start one of the, the key areas is we want to focus on sustainability and collaboration uh, let's come together we're already a really close-knit network uh, of aquariums uh, we share lots of information but then we want to come together on our research projects so we can be really inclusive with everyone and really answer those burning questions so as a, a, a working group we want to help facilitate this research we're not going to do it the aquariums and the, the universities etc are there but we want to help facilitate that and so the main priorities uh, that we've highlighted are yeah, as you've seen from the SNAP project, breeding, really important. There's so much more work to, to be done on that to really close that loop. So we want to close the loop on breeding. We want to understand those animal interactions, how they interact with each other and their surrounding. So we've got these mixed species uh, exhibits. Yeah, we talk about compatibility. We want to make sure we don't have aggressive species with the timid. But are there further complexities that are going on? 
we're learning more about animals in the wild. We're learning about uh, actually, you know, there's so much vocalization and sounds produced on reefs now that we never thought we, we never knew about. So actually, what's the impact within our displays? Yeah, as these animals are trying to communicate by acoustics. Uh, what's the impact that our filtration, our guests, etc., are having? So, how do they interact with the environment? Uh, how do they interact with each other? And again, let's look at producing uh, the best conditions possible because cl clearly, if we can get the, the breeding uh, going, then there's going to be an impact of, of how we can uh, repopulate uh, species uh, in the future. We need to understand how they're interacting with our displays and within each other. Want to improve welfare assessment? Uh, this is a really big, uh, see, important aspect. We already provide uh, the highest welfare standards that uh, we can, but really understanding our species, uh, we're going to be able to provide those, those even better conditions. We're always striving for the top. And so, uh, one of the key challenges of doing welfare assessments is that th there's as many fish species uh, in the world as there is all the mammals, reptiles, birds, and amphibians combined. So there's a huge amount of species to understand. Each one are having their own unique behaviors, their own life cycles coming from different environments that we need to be able to reproduce. So we need to really understand about those so we can give the most informed welfare assessments possible. There isn't really a one glove fits all approach. And so uh, clearly a lot of research needs to be done so we can give the best informed welfare assessment and end of life assessment as well. So these priorities all link together by understanding the breeding, the interactions, uh, we can really help improve with welfare assessment. And of course, we always want to look at health and disease. Yeah, we want the healthiest animals possible. We want them to thrive in, in the environments that we provide them. So we need to really understand their health, their nutrition, uh, their, their interactions, how they're, they're dealing with the environment, uh, fully understanding disease, what causes disease, where does it come from, and how can we treat it in the best uh, manner possible. So as a working group, we want to said facilitate this. We want to work on literature, literature reviews on those core priorities, find out where the questions are, where are the gaps in the research. We want to be inclusive with the uh, sector. So what are the burning questions that collections have? And you know, we want to help support that. So there might be someone that has a burning question about a particular species of fish that, that we can then help collaborate that science. Once we've got the information as a working group, we want to make sure we're, we're finding the best way uh, of sharing our key learnings. And what's really key is there's lots of colleges, universities, trade that's willing to support and get involved. So we need to find a way of collaborating with each other, finding a platform where we can have open discussion about what those questions are, how we're going to approach them uh, and the best way of dealing with it. And we all want, to, want to help create specific project titles and so not necessarily have uh, people come to us with ideas. I mean, that's always great, but actually collections going out and going, here's the question that we have. We really want someone to help answer this. Who's out there to deal with that? So that gives you a really brief insight into to the research that, that's happening at the moment uh, and where we want to move forward uh, as a, a sector and as a working group. And I really feel that these are key important priority areas uh, for us to look at. Cool, okay, well, thanks for your time. Uh, and I'll be hanging around for a little Q&A uh, within the comments. Uh, so please do feel free to ask and uh, let's move forward with acquiring research. Cool, thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and just a quick thank you to Frankie because she's hosting this from the um, Biaza main Zoom account. So thanks ever so much for your IT support. Um, and welcome everybody to this panel discussion. And I hope you've really enjoyed the conference today. I certainly have enjoyed listening to all our fabulous speakers and just such a great representation of zoo science that's going on currently and in the light of a very challenging situation. And we know that zoos are facing at the moment a, a huge struggle to just stay afloat because of COVID and the lockdown situation that's happened globally. And of course, most zoos are reliant on people walking through the door for their funds. And um, of course, that directly relates to the longevity and sustainability of zoos as we know it. 
We know also that the UK government has just recently, last week, I think, pledged another £100 million support for zoos. Um, but of course, in the zoo environment, we know that that money does not go very far. And zoos are going to face a huge amount of challenge over the next um, coming year and probably a little bit further to recover from this. Sadly, we already know that some colleagues um, are facing redundancy and that some zoos are looking at the real genuine possibility of closing down, which is heartbreaking. And so um, you might think that research doesn't really have a role to play in that. But actually, we know that certainly in the legislation, research is absolutely fundamental to the longevity of zoos. It's one of their major aims and it should be a fundamental underpinning to our husbandry and management practices. So without research, how would we know the next steps to improve welfare science? And what our conference has shown today is the really varied approaches that are used and the stunning amount of, of different science and different methodologies being applied to try and create better welfare and better lives for the animals in captivity. So, um, how this is going to work it's an open and free discussion for all of our panel members who are our speakers today and myself i didn't speak but um, i'm part of the BR's research committee so i'm the coordinator of the research um, sub engagement subgroup and usually my role is to coordinate all the abstract responses and to work with an organization to set the schedule for our annual conference um, so my role is slightly different this year in just facilitating this panel discussion. So I'm going to um, get started and to all of the panellists, just a reminder, when you speak, if you could just, um, the first time you do speak, just say who you are and your relationship with the BR's research committee, that would be fabulous. So um, we're going to start off as advertised and I'm going to pose you this question and please just jump on. Um, the first question then is, we are coming out of um, lockdown slowly but surely, um, but COVID still remains a very present threat, um, not just to society, but also to zoos within it. So what, ro what role does research play in the recovery of our zoos and our aquariums? Any takers for our first question? Everyone. Hi, it's Jessica Harley. Hi. Can you hear me okay? We can. I've lost my internet. So uh, if, if I sound really bad, just let me know and I'll drop off um, because I'm just using my phone for Wi-Fi, which isn't great. But uh, I think, uh, and I don't have video. Um, in terms of the importance of research, uh, we're presently looking at the imp we're looking at the impact of uh, of the lockdown. So we've started research while we were closed and we just opened last week. So we're continuing and we're using a similar methodology, the transect method, uh, to look at behavior across the species um, and see there was a lot of press out uh, in terms of, you know, certain animals looked unhappy because they were missing their visitors. But we really were basing a lot of that anecdotal um, and this is going to allow us to really know definitively uh, the reaction of some of the animals. So I think research is integral. Um, this is an event in its own right, uh, an event of you know global proportion. So at this opportunity, you know, to look at how not having visitor footfall and then all of a sudden having visitor footfall is going to impact behavior. I mean, I'd love to be doing physiology, but I think. Because of COVID-19, that's a, a little bit difficult at this time with labs still being closed. So one tool that we can count on is behavior and we can thankfully count on our keepers who have been, who will have maybe a greater role in research going forward because we won't be able to get people outsourced to come in or students coming in. So our keepers may in fact take a greater role in being involved and pushing research forward. That's a really brilliant point, Jess, thank you. The keepers and the fundamental role of keepers, often um, being a researcher as I am now, but for a very short period of time being a zookeeper, I understand how important it is to know each and every one of your animals individually. And you know those individuals with a personality type, with different traits, with different characteristics. And, um, the role of the zookeeper really, I think, um, going forward is fundamental to the sustainability of our zoo. 
Zookeepers, we know, are, are charged with the care and the husbandry of all of the animals um, in the zoo, but they're also ambassadors for it. And they're usually highly skilled people who are highly, highly educated. And that is so fundamentally um, overlooked. Um, can any of you kind of build on, on Jess's really great point there that actually it's the role of the zookeeper that we need to be focusing on primarily if we're going to enhance further the research done in zoos? Yeah, I think I can I can comment on that um, because I think and that's maybe a bit of a scary thought for someone that wants to get a job as a researcher in a zoo after my PhD. But based on what's happening at the moment with this pandemic, uh, we can see that if zoos are struggling financially, and it's not their fault, it's because of the situation. But if they are struggling financially, they have to, they need to have priorities in terms of even employees. And if of course the keepers they can't get rid of in a way that because they need the keepers to feed the animals. So it's, I mean, I think all jobs within a zoo are vital, but keepers are vital, vital, vital. And if the zoo is uh, struggling financially and sadly, very sadly, the researchers have to be let go, then the research will fall onto the zookeepers who already have a very busy schedule as we already know, but it, they, it will be, the, the research will be dependent on the work of zookeepers, really, if the researchers cannot, you know, be employed the zoo because the zoo does not have the resources to pay them. So it will either be volunteers and students, as, as, is, as is often the case, but also much of it will fall onto the zookeepers who, like you said, is, are very, very, very often highly educated mm -hmm. and have a scientific background as well. But it's also a matter of whether they have the time to do it because zookeepers also have a very busy schedule. So... Yeah, absolutely. Paul, do you have your hand up? I do, yeah, in a, in a waving <laughs> kind of manner. Um, yeah, hi, folks. Um, Dr. Paul Rose, Vice Chair of the Research Committee. Um, I just want to kind of build on, I think, yeah, what both Jess and Ricardo have said about the role of the keeper, but from a slightly different angle, and maybe this is a really good point to have research seen as not an optional extra that zookeepers do when they have the time, but actually is fundamental to how the modern zoo goes forward and perhaps it's a way of convincing the higher echelons of power in zoological collections that science can save you money and we've seen that from many examples of research that have been published in the Wales Research Community conferences in the past that science allows you to streamline how you keep your animals, it allows you to be more efficient, it allows you to keep them in a better manner. It's not something that just gets in the way of regular day-to-day -day cleaning and if we can't do the same amount of research with dedicated research officers in the future keepers however they are structured in their working day have the time to collect data on their animals which ultimately makes the keepers lives better and improves a lot of the animals that they're looking after as well thanks paul that's a really interesting point and and really well made i think um a few years ago when we were based um in the edinburgh research conference um we did a workshop on um the enrichment and we asked for keeper opinions which um obviously paul and i then and um, we're lucky enough to go and publish that research. And we found that a lot of keepers who are highly skilled individuals are sometimes thwarted um, by perhaps a lack of support um, from a wider sphere, because some people might judge that enrichment and closely related to that, the enrichment, um, sorry, the, the, the research based elements of welfare are somehow on the periphery of everybody else's job. And um, really we've shown, and hopefully some of the talks today, um, particularly Sonia, your talk on regurgitation and re-ingestion comes to mind. If we didn't have that fundamental research basis, we would not be able to apply strategies effectively to try and help those great apes overcome this abnormal behavior. And um, I'm wondering if there is anything um, you guys think we can do to try and help keepers moving forward and just to highlight some of the resources that the Biaza research committee already has that keepers can access and um and utilize in this next stage of post-covid recovery i can jump in here if that's okay so i'm dr sonia hill and um, so in terms of resources fantastic resource of course is the Biaza research handbook that's freely available online um, and so that's got a huge amount of information in there about all different kinds of uh, research projects that students, uh, keepers, 
anybody can access and can make use of. And there's a, a chapter in there that I um, was one of the authors of on keepers getting involved in enrichment related research. But of course, a lot of the stuff that's in that particular chapter could be applied to other types of zoo based research involving keepers as well. But as Ricardo mentioned, one of the key challenges is keepers being given the time within their job, certainly within the UK, given the time within their jobs to do research, to carry it out. And I think it needs that kind of that shift in really focusing on the fact that research is fundamental. And I think it was Paul who said we should move away from this idea, ideally move away from this idea of research as an optional extra, um, a sort of luxurious thing that zoos can do and see it much more as a fundamental part of that evidence-based management of collections. So it doesn't necessarily resolve the issue, but at least it's kind of thinking about how we can try and convince managers and so on going forward to give much more priority to research than maybe has been given in the past. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, a top level down approach really into showing the value of the, the research that's already fed into welfare practices that we have and the guidelines that are established. Of course, Biasa is research based and um, would always be evidence based in their approach. But as an industry, we need to be evidence based in our applications of husbandry and management more widely. Um, Jess, I wonder if you're still with us and um, if you could just talk about the um, Biasa welfare toolkit just for a sec. I am still with you. Um, so the Biaza Welfare Toolkit is freely available to Biaza members and it has been distributed um, even wider than that, but it is a toolkit that gives you uh, all the resources that you need to basically modify and tailor uh, your welfare assessment template. And, and in turn, by doing that, your welfare management strategy, which is really important, which is what I touched on earlier today when I was talking about events. So we have this event, but we need a welfare strategy to support that event, um, which was a special welfare assessment just relating to that event or any event that we do. And certainly looking at COVID, I think there was a question from somebody that said, you know, what if you find out you know, some of your animals liked it better when there wasn't footfall and then how do you balance you know visitors the need for visitors but i think that we take that information what knowledge we gain and then we act upon it appropriately it could be you know having greater retreat areas moving animals to different locations in the zoo that might have less visitor of footfall if we were to find something like that or we might find that species, um, and this has been talked a lot about primate species, and well, obviously we're looking at our primates through the study, and ZSL is doing a similar study. NTU has this study uh, with multiple zoos being involved in the pre, post, during COVID, some longitudinal studies um, where we can, you know, we can find out, and then we could make, you know, informed-based decisions um, on, you know, locations in the zoo, what type of furnishings, what type of um, uh, you know, uh, cover that's necessary, um, but and also thinking about the visitor, which is, uh, you know, we have to with everything that we do because they are integral and crucial. We don't exist without them. And thus but, don't, the animals don't. But anyway, I probably went off topic about the toolkit, but the toolkit is, is a wonderful resource um, and, and, and it can be modified as I showed you today with the event planning and using an aspect of the welfare assessment template. And we hope to do more chapters. Uh, it's a living document, so it will grow um, as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Jess. So um, any keepers that are listening and um, for all of us just to take on board, really, there are already a wealth of resources and just go check them out on the Biaza um, website um, and also on the Biaza Research Committee Facebook page. There are links everywhere now to particularly the, the um, Welfare Toolkit, which is just truly an excellent resource. And um, I'm wondering, guys on the panel, um, potentially uh, Bridget and Lewis particularly, were your um, organisations able to maintain a research portfolio during the lockdown period? And um, what research are you going to try and do coming out of that lockdown? So for Nosley, um, we were furloughed, like I think most departments were, but we're very lucky in that we already have a really good relationship with a lot of our keepers. So we managed to get the research kind of up and running through them. It wasn't um, like the kind of pre-planned, you know, nice project that you'd normally have in mind, but 
making sure that we have that data available so that when people are back in the office, which is starting to happen now, um, we can really make a difference. And for us, we tried to focus on animals um, that we maybe had some data for already. So we, for example, we had some cameras um, but monitoring our wolf behaviour anyway. So then by continuing that throughout lockdown and now that lockdown's easy and we're open again, it's created that longitudinal data set. So we kind of jumped on things that we already had going that we could then kind of turn into the project. But I mean, that was solely down to the enthusiasm of the keepers. And, you know, from the research perspective, we can't thank them enough for that. It's the difference has been um, incredible. We wouldn't have been able to do it without them. Brilliant. And Lewis, thank you. Um, yeah, probably very similar to Bridget, actually. So again, we're really lucky, as I know a lot of zoos are, to have, uh, have a really good um, support base and work a lot with the keepers. Uh, so just before uh, several of us, or most of our department were furloughed, we were able to get the transect method, which we developed, um, which I know Jess has talked about. Uh, we were able to get that out and the sec all the sections have been really brilliant um, but also uh, you know vet nurses and the essential, other essential staff that were on site were able to carry on collecting that rapid data. Um, we've also tried to have in the few cases where we have um, CCTV for example set up we've got that ongoing and we're making sure that footage is being banked. Um, we've also in an, an attempt to try and look at the physiology, we've got a couple of cases where we've been collecting fecal samples um, during the lockdown process and we'll carry that on. So we're doing that in collaboration with uh, colleagues at Chester Zoo because they have the endocrinology lab and obviously the advantage of that is we can bank the samples, uh, frozen samples, and then they'll be able to be used in the future hopefully. Um, and then we've been lucky that since just before we were reopened to the public, um, myself and my colleague were able to come back and start collecting more of that transect data but also try and focus on species again where, where there were uh, longitudinal data sets already um, and try and do some more detailed observations on those um, trying to balance it across different taxa uh, but then just to give us an idea of how the reopening is affecting their behavior that's brilliant so um, it's it's just wonderful to hear that some research projects were still ongoing throughout this um, period and we do understand of course even though um, you know we're all scientists and we all love research and we all prioritize research as a zoo role we understand how fundamentally difficult it is when you have no money coming in no people coming through the door to support you and you are down to a bare minimum staff that have to feed clean out um, enrich look after observe communicate with and be there for all of the animals so adding in one other dimension to that is is really hard going so it's great to hear that certain lines of research were still established i'm wondering then as an academic on the panel um, is there are there things that um, you guys who are firmly based in the zoo think that academics could be doing what what i just heard um, a little bit then was um, perhaps if we could facilitate by giving information about protocols and methodologies then we can still have a positive influence as academics to allowing the zoo staff themselves to actually collect research data and then perhaps liaising with research with the zoo staff to um, analyze that data with them i wonder um perhaps lou and perhaps sonia and maybe chris if um, we haven't heard from you yet as well and if you've got any thoughts on that that would be great Yeah, hi guys. Uh, so I'm the um, research liaison for the Aquarium Working Group. Um, so one of the things I think that could be really beneficial moving forward where um, certainly we need to form those connections between collections and universities, colleges, etc. Is, is actually looking at the, the wealth of data that's available within collections. Um, so my background being um, public aquariums and you know, within uh, our collections, the amount of data we're recording from, you know, obviously if the, the, our water changes, the so water quality to our, our diets uh, and, and what's being fed, etc. that there's so much data 
there that is, is keepers and curators that, that there isn't the time available to analyze that and really uh, get down in, into some of the details and find if there's questions that can be answered from that information. So I think certainly moving forward uh, that where we're not going to be able to so much do those uh, in-house research projects and having people come into our zoos and our collections that, that there's an opportunity there to really utilize the, the data that's available uh, within collections. Uh, for further research. That's a really fantastic point. Of course, um, every keeper makes daily records about the animals that they look after. And um, there is an absolute wealth of research in there. And a lot of you know um, Species 360 and um, the ZIMS data collection um, software. And certainly myself and my PhD res um, research students are utilising that as a data resource. And I think at the moment it is fundamentally poorly recognised that those streams of data actually exist. So um, Chris, thank you so much for making the point. Um, you guys in the zoo industry are taking data every single day and um, this is perhaps a really brilliant time to start capitalising upon it and working out those fundamental questions. You know, you might have all of the systems there, but really how much does the temperature change in an environment? Um, how does that relate to the animals change in behavioural expression, for example? They're fundamental questions about the husbandry of the animals that we look after and they're somewhat overlooked. Um, maybe this is an opportunity then to get back to the fundamentals of animal welfare science and start to apply what we already know, established methodologies, but just in slightly different ways and perhaps with a greater range of species that we'd ever really mainstream science has considered before. Um, Lou, I know you've done some really interesting work with your students this year and um, your camera trap information, looking at another application of methodology. Um, have you got any, any advice that you can offer, um, any kind of nuggets of, of information, perhaps trying to expand the, the range of species that you're looking at? Yeah, I'd like to say do it in your animal um, establishment at college or uni. <laughs> <Joke>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm on one leg plugged into the wall trying to keep up on the Zoom on, on my phone here. Um, yeah, and there's quite a few comments and questions coming in about the importance of uni students and uni lecturers and involving in this as well. And I think um, the biggest problem we've got now is in terms of zoo access. For zoos that have got strict numbers and strict limitations this year, um, we're going to be reducing the amount of students that are actually out working in zoos under internships, work experience, research projects and so on. So we're going to have to be a bit more savvy. Also, not forgetting the amount of data that uh, supervisors have, both research supervisors in zoos and like, like us in unis and so on, that have amount of data just piling up and piling up, you know. So there's data from last year's students, years before, that could roll out and we could reuse in different projects, looking at different ideas. Cross do multi zoo research, we do that a lot, but we kind of, until it's published, keep it not between ourselves, but within the zoo community. So perhaps put calls out to other institutions, you know, and, and not necessarily just zoos, there's plenty of colleges that have zoo licenses, you know, Ask and Brian just being one receive and so on, where we will be able to access because of having staff that work there. And between us, we've got a wealth of contacts, you know, and people listening today. Also camera trap stuff, camera traps is great. Hopefully I promoted it and showed you the good side as well as the bad side, but we still need access. And, and if staff are on a limited amount because of uh, tight budgets and so on, we can't really be bothering them to going in and out, messing about with SD cards and batteries every day and so on and so on. Um, power of Zims. Um, keeper notes if people have got um, friends who are keepers perhaps you could get them involved because I know a, a number of keepers who really want to do something with the research um, and from student projects as well I think maybe we, we, we really do promote looking at um, using data we've already got this year and you know presenting it to other students to then write up with a different angle whether it's visitors, weather, uh, season, animals, groupings, all that kind of stuff. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Lou. Um, oh, Paul's got his hand up. I was coming to you next, Paul. Uh, can oh. I? I'll introduce the as a great bridge between working in both <laughs> academia and <laughs> a zoo organisation. Paul, do you have any thoughts? <laughs> that was that was seamless. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> 
Um, I just wanted to, yeah, to really um, reiterate what, what Lou just said. And if I just put my WWT hat on for the moment, um, and I don't want to point my finger at the universities, but I'm going to. I've seen a lot of people come through the doors scrabbling for projects this summer with little to no guidance from academic members of staff. And that's not fair on the students. And the universities need to engage with the zoo community so that the projects that are offered are useful, not just for the undergraduate ticking a box to fulfill their final year project needs, but also for the zoos themselves that have the resources. And I think if there was some way of us building those bridges, we would then have projects that could answer these bigger research questions because they could be longitudinal, they could run over multiple seasons, they could fulfil the, the zoo's benefits and they could also fulfil the university's benefits. But what I think we get a lot of at the moment is the student comes in and does the projects and then goes and then the follow up of that is really, really difficult. The issue that we all have is we sit on this committee for free and we give our own time to it because we love what we do but we're not also in charge of the university departments. And I think if there's a good thing to come out of COVID and this closure of zoos, dare I say that, this lack of access to, to zoo animals is that we work better with the universities to work out how we actually answer these questions, if that's going to be a challenge to do science in the future, because I think they're also in the same boat, is that they're looking for ways to do research, like the zoos are looking for ways to do research as well. Mm. Absolutely. I think the research is fundamentally part of both the academic and the zoo world. And um, as you rightly say, finding the best way to marry those two together in the future is um, absolutely fundamental, therefore, to the progress that we all make. Um, Alana, Elena, sorry, if I can um, get you up on the mic. Um, I thought your take on the research was just brilliant and um, how you're engaging to see what the public are making of this. And part of your research that really um, inspired me was how you've already co considered the effect of COVID and how people are staying engaged with the zoos. And um, perhaps if you could just give us a synopsis of that research and what the future you think um, of that research will be. So I think um, well, I was quite happy to see that people are staying connected with the zoos and the fact that they've got more involved in watching the webcams because again being previously in the zoo world you're like are people watching are, are they are they watching and I think that could be another way for students to use um, in their research is the webcams like I saw Smithsonian's webcams are amazing um, so there's lots of different ways that people can stay connected and they have um, other ways hopefully going forward I kind of briefly mentioned about people kind of having social reasons for why they felt connected to the animals. It's something that I want to look at more. And especially when people start going back to the zoos because they want to reconnect with their family and friends because they haven't seen them for six months. And um, looking at, you know, what aspects of the zoo are actually helping these social connections between people themselves, as well as the connections that they're having with the animals as well. Because people are going to be looking for that after such a long time of kind of social isolation. Um, so I think connections is kind of twofold with what's going on in the research that I'm doing. It's one between the humans and the animals, but also what's going on and how the humans are using the animals as uh, a way of communicating, connecting with each other as well. So that's kind of where that is going. Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of that bit <laughs> and where that bit is going with um, the research. Brilliant. I think then for the academics on the, on the panel, um, is there anything immediately that you can think of that you say, OK, I should be doing this and I should be encouraging my students to do this going forward? Um, I'm going to kick off. And, and that is um, you just mentioned it, the, the use of the webcams. Um, there are some just brilliant webcams there and they're free and people can still get a great zoo experience by looking and tracing the animals on the webcam. And there are definite research opportunities there. Um, it would be really encouraging to start seeing some applications coming through to the Biaza Research Committee in the future that try to, to utilise that stream of data more. Um, Sonia, any, any, um, any comments? Um, I think I'd agree with what you've said there, Lisa. The webcam footage, if it's clear enough footage that students can get good, reliable behavioural data from, then that's such a fantastic resource for people to use. I would say it's probably worth still checking with the zoo, each zoo, whose webcams you want to use for research, that they're happy for you to do that. Um, obviously, there's all the current challenges with reduced staff numbers and so on in zoos, so it might be hard to know exactly who to contact because the normal p 
people might be on you know furlough leave or whatever um but i think as a sort of matter of courtesy it's i personally think if i was still working in a zoo i would want to be asked as a zoo representative if it was okay to use um the webcam footage and i'm sure the answer would be yes but it's just a courtesy thing and um, because it's still using the zoo resources if you like for research purposes um, I think as well the points made earlier about using existing data sets whether it's data sets from the zoo themselves or from um, the likes of Zims um, but also supervisors with the data sets like Lou said we've all got um, data sitting around from previous student projects or from our own research that students might be able to make use of it's difficult managing the students' expectations with that sometimes because, of course, for a lot of people, they want that live animal experience. They want to be standing in front of an enclosure collecting their data, even if that's not possible right now. Um, and so sitting at a desk analysing pre-existing data might not be quite what the person had in mind. So there's kind of a, a managing expectation side of it as well, just because none of us can control what's going on pandemic-wise, obviously. Um, but I think some of the other things to bear in mind with the use of uh, records in Zims, I've been involved in a few studies that have involved using different types of data from Zims, and we've published a few of those papers. And one of the papers where we were trying to use uh, behavioural records in Zims, we found that to be too unreliable, really. Of course, the daily records from keepers and so on are fantastic for certain things. So there'll be different priorities that people are recording on each day there's not necessarily consistency because they're not recording it with a research purpose in mind unless it is as part of a research project that already exists so in terms of using retrospective data from things like Zims, it can be a little bit difficult if it's behavioural um, but for other types of data like um, to do with nutrition or um, you know, we've used data on births and woundings um, and those are obviously more reliable records because those are the types of things that would get recorded and um, so there are different challenges in place but I think certainly in terms of university students should be chatting as early as they can with their supervisors I don't know, at Chester we're doing that already um, to try and kind of manage those expectations of the students but also to try and um, get students going on their projects because certainly a lot of our students would be hoping to collect their data or starting one way or the other on their projects over the summer holidays and so we kind of all need to get going on it as quickly as we can. Absolutely, I think speed's of the essence really, isn't it? To, um, to facilitate the zoos and their research needs, but also for the academics and the student research needs too. So that's a brilliant point, thank you. And Bridget, I see your hand up, so please go ahead. Oh, yeah. sorry, Sonia, Sonia's got sorry. just one more point to make, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Bridget. Um, one more thing I'd forgotten to say as well is that certainly the taxon working groups, um, and I know we've got a few taxon working group reps here on the panel, um, taxon working groups used to, put forward the research ideas, research priorities and so on. I'm not sure how up to date those, Lou's giving me a big smile. I'm not sure how <laughs> up to date those lists are. I know from when I was Mammal Working Group Taxon, <laughs> be quiet. Um, it was incredibly challenging to keep those kinds of lists up to date. Um, but there might be some nuggets of useful information on there, Lou, yeah, right. anyone? <laughs> yeah, it depends very much on the working group, but it's the best place to start. I think, um, Bridget, can, can we come to you now for your comment and... Um... Yeah, so I was just going to build up something that Sonia said as well, getting in touch with the university supervisor as soon as possible, but also if you do want to try and do anything with a zoo, even if it is remotely, getting in touch with them as soon as possible, because particularly with the limited staffing at the minute and even the staff that are in aren't necessarily working on the department that they'd always work in, or maybe they're part-time and things like that. And I don't think it would ever be that the zoo doesn't want to get involved in research still but it's just things are a lot more difficult at the minute so planning in even extra time more extra time than you normally would i think is going to be really important for getting zoos on board with student projects um, have you have you found bridget that your um research priorities at the zoo have changed over the covid lockdown 
Um, I think it's difficult because we still like we still have our big projects that we want to focus on but equally you don't want to miss an opportunity and this is undeniably a really really unique opportunity to gather data that we'd never be able to get before so yeah I think we have shifted our priorities a little bit to take advantage of a really unique data set. Um, and um, for the whole panel are there are you adjusting your research priority lists as we speak are there going to be new focuses of research in the future do you anticipate or have you already evidenced i think for, for us from the aquarium side um we were going to be readjusting the working group's priorities this year anyway and it's just coincided with covid that see this will now have an influence in the priorities and, and more so about how we go about doing those research projects and how we you know, utilize data that's available so yeah there's definitely gonna be an update coming from uh, the, the aquarium working group that's adjusted due to covid that's that's brilliant thank you um any other groups that have yep sonia's back <laughs> it wasn't so thanks lisa it wasn't so much a, a group related question as such but one of the questions that's come through on the chat um that's um following on from my regurgitation and re-ingestion talk earlier and elaine is asking with regards to regurgitation and re-ingestion did any zoos taking part in this research notice a reduction in this activity during lockdown um I haven't got any data from the lockdown period, unfortunately, but I don't know if anybody else on the panel has been involved in any data collection that might involve regurgitation and re-ingestion or if anybody else in the audience has. But it would certainly be that and other behaviours, of course, would be so interesting to know if there have been any um, even anecdotal reports of, of changes in behaviour, even if we haven't got that kind of more robust evidence. Absolutely. I think a lot of the science, I think the hard and fast scientists are quite quick to dismiss anecdotal evidence, but often that's the starting point to make change and to make research inquiries um, because we're getting snapshots of information that can really lead to something interesting. And often it's coming directly from the keepers or the people that work in zoos and that are obviously observing the animals all the time, just as part of everyday processes. Um, so that's a great point. Thank you. Um, I think research um, priorities are definitely going to um, change. One of the aspects we're all animal welfare scientists or behaviorists or very much focused on the animal concepts and and conservation and welfare but what about the people um, as well so i'm wondering if any of you have thought about diversifying to um, doing some keeper studies and maybe the morale on keepers and um, the threats that they face and the challenges that they face. I know we all have worked very closely with keepers in the past and continue to do so to facilitate our research. But um, are any of you thinking perhaps of diversifying a bit and maybe core cool questions that we might ask if we want to actually understand the keeper side of this current situation a bit better? Oh, we've all gone quiet because I've asked a load of animal welfare scientists about humans. <laughs> I'm right. Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks, Lou. I'm just wondering from the mammal working group perspective, because um, there is a, a mass array of keepers out there working at all different levels in terms of seasonal staff, trainees, uh, curators, ones who've been qualified for years and so on. Potentially, that's something we could maybe try and roll out at the mammal working group. Famous last words. Look out. And treat <laughs> Um, but we have got a meeting next week, um, so I'll take it to there and definitely say because I think in terms of the amount of work that all keepers have had to do, especially say people who work on hoof stock, for example, you might have 2,000 animals to care for that day, which you might have to do in, sh in half the time you would have previously had. Bearing in mind you don't have visitors to, but a lot of those keepers probably never really involved in the visitor depending on you know the paddocks the size of enclosures and so on so potentially that's something in the mammal working group we could start with hoof stock staff for example um, and then try and see if we can compare that to carnivore staff or staff who work much closely with like the sea lions and the elephants and i think yeah that's a really interesting place to start and um, i know we've got a few people on the committee who are very social scientists um, and a few colleagues and so on so i think in terms of the people side i think it's a great opportunity that we really need to explore most definitely 
Great. Uh, oh, um, Paul's going to come in. I, I just at this point want to interject and just say to those people that are watching, great to have you along. And of course, we are talking about the Biaza Research Committee and the research done in zoos. At the moment, the research committee is not reviewing those applications um, to do research across multiple institutions, um, simply because a lot of the staff and the members on, on that research committee are furloughed in their roles um, in the zoo. So um, just watch this space and there will be announcement from the Biasa Research Committee in due course about when we will start up that service again. Um, Paul, over to you. You had your hand up. Yeah, um, I was just going to say on the people side of things, if I take off my WWC hat and put on my University of Exeter hat, um, the big universities are struggling with ethics approval for research at the moment. And anything to do with people obviously contains a lot more ethical review than animals. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of, of research has stopped, which I think is really sad because it's an ideal time to do science. And I think a lot of academics are itching to do the science that you just talked about but they can't do it at the moment because the universities themselves are close to external research. Um, but Keeper Diaries and anecdotes and potential directed questions or surveys afterwards of people's experiences once ethical review is allowed again um, would be something really valuable. I think if there was a group that could club together and find the out the experiences of zookeepers during a pandemic, that would be really invaluable evidence. But I think the reason Partly the reason that you're not seeing it at the moment is the big sociology departments have had their hands tied, so to speak, mm. from actually being able to collect any data. Mm. It is such a challenge in time because, um, of course, all of the academics are rewriting avidly so that all of their resources can be made available online. Um, and as we adjust to an ever changing situation, um, we've understood that there is a need to fulfill our students. Um, desires to study to actually diversify which nicely brings me on to a ne the next point that I'd like to raise with you guys. Um, I asked uh, after one of the um, conference presentations earlier about the diversification of zoos and I'm wondering about the sustainability of zoos. We have as I said in my introduction unfortunately seen that certain zoos um, within our network even are facing closure because of the lockdown um, environment and the just the lack of funds and support um, more generally from the government but um, she says topically um, but what are what are the future sustainability what is the future sustainability of zoos as we know it and how does research help with that sustainability um, I'm, I'm I'm sure you guys need to be kind of careful of what you say, but if there's anything you can share that your organisation is thinking, actually, we need to change the profile of who we are and what we do um, to, to, to remain viable. Um, any comments from anybody on that point? Who's that? Uh, Bridget. Oh, Bridget. Uh, Hi, Bridget. Um, I would just say that it, I think it's... Um, it's come up in the in the chat a little bit as well is that what's really apparent is during lockdown people have benefited so much from nature and from getting out in nature and getting outdoors and that's something that zoos and aquariums i know are really conscious of now and are really starting to look into what the uh, sort of mental benefits are to a visit to a zoo or aquarium and i think that that's something that we all as collections need to look at and think actually this is probably a really really strong way forward for us in that it's benefits for the public as well as benefits for the animals and benefits that we've not really thought about before and I think that's probably uh, an incentive for some people that maybe wouldn't have considered zoos and aquariums before as a place to visit or a place to go so I think I think reframing ourselves in that context is potentially a really valuable way forward and a way that would maybe make us more sustainable in the future because the benefits are for more people. That's a great point. Um, Elena, over to you. Yeah, I would just echo exactly what Bridget has said. Um, it's one of, again, the future ideas to the, the studies that I'm planning, hopefully, um, is looking at the other benefits to people uh, visiting the zoos, not just learning about animals or really kind of pushing the behaviour change, but also their own well-being. Um, more future studies that I want to look into is basically people's well-being kind of even before and after a zoo visit, um, before and after a keeper experience and see if we're actually increasing people's mental health um, 
by you know interacting with the animals but again giving more opportunity to interact with each other and finding a chance to to bond over something um, and that's a key aspect to, to human well-being so again like Bridget said we can be selling ourselves in a different way yes definitely we are 100% about conservation and education but we also want to promote um, the well-being of our, of our visitors that's a brilliant point thank you the on Twitter and on any social media if you um, kind of keep up with people who have opinions on zoos obviously some people are um, not that keen on zoos because of ethical considerations and um, obviously there are people who are extremely pro zoos we work in the, the zoo industry um, and we always want to try to do the very best for our, our animals under our care but also for the people that are coming through the door I'm going to set you a kind of more challenging question, I think now, and slightly out of remit. But um, for me, one of the reasons why we're in this COVID situation is because we have lost respect for nature and um, we have become so detached from the natural world that we have just lost its value. We don't see it as something to be cherished and protected. We see it as something to be used and to gain from. And I'm wondering if you think there is a role for zoos more generally to try and bridge that gap between the general public who doesn't care about animals, who th they don't think about animals on a daily basis or the welfare of conservations of an ecosystem. It isn't in their remit to, to think about it. Is there an opportunity for zoos to close that gap? Um, I was thinking in general as well to build on the points from earlier. So historically, I think zoos have not been that great as a community at disseminating the work that we do outside of of our community of our community. Um, and obviously, we're aware, especially from the range of talks today, it's not just we don't just look at animal behaviour. We don't just look at the animals in the zoo. Zoos are very much places of science now, um, and there are those links between our in situ projects and how the zoos and the zoo populations can benefit those. Um, sort of wild ecosystems as well so going forward uh, just being better at communicating that and making that link more apparent so we're changing the face of what a visit to the zoo is it's not just a day out at the zoo for recreation um, and there's gonna be great education but it's also just to show how how much of a strong place it does have in science and then that's a key way that we could bridge the gap a bit more and certainly for me and um, those of you who know me know I'm all about the primates really um, but we make a lot of fuss about green space usually but there's a huge potential for that blue space as well so Chris if you're still around um, any thoughts that you have on on encouraging that link to blue space would be brilliant yeah I think uh, there's yeah the the oceans because we, we don't we can't see it from our, our general day-to-day -day perspective we don't know what's going on and I think there's definitely that aspect for for aquariums but when we're walking around our, our collections we we see this whole different world that, that we've that we just don't know about and yeah I've certainly from my public aquarium days you, you see that those wow moments where when people start seeing the, the behaviors and and the, the the different diversity of species that we have uh, and it, that starts to draw a connection and but I think sometimes that you still don't quite get that um, appreciation of what's going on in the wild and it's certainly sometimes when we start looking at um, the, the impacts that we're having on the, on the wild where uh, we might introduce an exhibit that's looking at plastic pollutions uh, or it, you know, the, the overfishing of livestock uh, and when we start connecting those, those negative aspects and, and putting in um, comparisons of what's going on in the wild that we, we start seeing those kind of light bulb moments of oh yes that we're having that impact uh, on the wild and then yeah, as long as we're then giving uh, people the sort of the take home message of how they can help improve things um, when they, they leave that we, we start seeing those uh, relationships with the wild going going on so I think there's definitely a position um, for, for aquariums to you know, definitely build up those uh, relationships with, with the oceans the rivers and be that eye into what's actually going on uh, under the surface uh, for people because you get so many people who you know especially for the inner city aquariums who you know some, some visitors have never been to a beach uh, they, they've never had that opportunity so you can create that connection early on uh, then yeah we, we stand a greater chance of helping protect those oceans.
that's a great point thank you for making it because um it's that connectivity on a wider scale isn't it for for people who um perhaps don't have any role models to um, look up to for for inspiring their love in nature um, who find it difficult who are um so far removed from nature it's the zoos and aquariums that make that leap um, and that can introduce somebody and just spark their imagination so hopefully a future generation of conservationists are going to zoos now or are wanting to get back into a zoo stroke aquarium environment so that they can educate themselves they can start to learn how zoos and aquariums play a fundamental role in ecosystem conservation um, I know through the committee that we see an awful lot of research um, that we review um, proposals for fundamental conservation um, research that is based in zoos and that's a really great thing to see making that connection and Ricardo um, I asked after your talk, talk today um, about the reintroduction of parrots for example what we see with primates is um, so much effort going into rehabilitation of primates so that they can be successfully reintroduced but unfortunately the reintroduction is often unsuccessful um, and um, Ricardo I wonder if you could just comment because your talk really really captured for me that link between getting people interested in fundamental behavior of an animal and the conservation of that species and what's the role to play what can we learn going forward from this So yes, so I think it's, it's it's very important for people. I think for people to understand the the exact role of zoos, because even now many people don't know exactly what's about, and many people still have even with captive breeding and reintroduction, which we all know has been amazing work and many species saved. But it's very challenging, and many many people still have this romantic idea that you just open the door and the animal is happy in the wild and this problem is solved. And people don't know how much effort, how much money, how much expertise and resources go behind it and it's important to people to know that and be, because that also brings light onto the important work of zoos because they put a lot of effort into these programs when they exist and they don't always succeed but sometimes they do and when they don't succeed what can we learn from the failures that have happened to improve make sure it doesn't happen again so it, there's a lot to, to, to learn from this process and we actually need to share that as well, the conservation successes and also step by step the work that's into it. So not just saying we've released animals and it worked and they are now in the wild and the species was kind of saved and it's amazing. It's great to share that message, but we want to tell step by step how hard it was. You know, we had to spend this money, this amount of stuff, this amount of hours. And it's important to highlight each step so people know exactly how much work goes into it. Absolutely. I think one of the things zoos don't often do um, is sing their praises enough in conservation projects. When you engage with zoos, you realise just how much direct conservation action is happening in a zoo environment. But that often isn't publicised that well. Um, one of the questions we've had from um, our listeners, and thank you for your questions, um, is what is the role of social media? It seems like to keep people engaged with zoos over the lockdown period zoos have been capitalizing on social media and what is the the role of social media going forward any comments anybody i think we've seen a huge increase in the the number of behind the scenes tours and sort of keeper interactions uh, with their animals and as probably a side of of what we do that the public don't generally see the, the kind of behind the scenes the feeding of the sharks how we keep the filtri filtration systems working and I think if we sort of carry on with, with that uh, process moving forward that yes we want to encourage people into our collections but it you've got that um, extra element to, to see what's going on that you create that that connection again look at the connections you, you create that with uh, with your audience at your public beforehand and use that as kind of your your lure to, to get them into the collections and uh, and see what's going on but i think yeah definitely a, a space to move forward and carry on with those sort of keep alive uh, elements that are going on yeah it's one more opportunity to get people engaged but also to showcase what zoos are doing um and fundamentally to educate people isn't it of 
the animals that are being looked after and the amount of care that they need and like Ricardo just said what actually goes into a conservation program and um, conservation doesn't just happen in host countries that are in the field um, conservation is happening in classrooms right the way around the globe but it's also happening in our zoos and aquariums um, Bridget did you have a comment to make yeah, I just wondered if lockdown has given zoos on social media an opportunity that they don't normally have, because I think there's, it's so hard for zoos. And I think Paul's got a paper that highlights this, which is like that balance between getting people through the door and kind of giving them fun facts versus that actual conservation messaging, education messaging, things like that. And because in lockdown, they couldn't get people to come through the doors. Did it give them that moment to think, oh, what else could we do on social media? And there's been so many brilliant examples of things that, um, that collections have done in this time. So how do we kind of keep that momentum going as we reopen to get that balance right between the really, really important message of please come to our zoo, please come and buy a ticket. But then also, by the way, this is the amazing stuff the zoo's doing. I think it's a really, really difficult challenge. But now that lockdown has shown what, how you can engage people with these kind of other messages. How do we keep that going? I, I don't have an answer to that at all, but I just think it's something to really consider because it's, yeah, lockdown gave us an opportunity that we just never had before on social media. That's kind of how I've seen it anyway. Absolutely. Maybe um, the social media reach has created a new audience for zoos um, that perhaps would not have visited a zoo beforehand. Um, and certainly a lot of the students that I teach currently um, are, are ethically opposed to zoos but when you rationalise the important work that zoos do you do fundamentally see a role for them going forward. Um, in some of the, the questions and comments um, from people watching we've had highlighted the role of zoos as an education establish establishment and um, the joy that you can get by taking a group of um, students whether they be young kids or young adults um, into a zoo for an educational um, and immersive experience with a nature that you wouldn't necessarily get access to um, and that's really great to hear um, we're also seeing a little bit of opposition from people and of course the financial constraints people um, are, of course in the school environment um, covid is causing a huge amount of change and therefore what if a lot of school children don't get to zoos? Um, maybe that's one other reason why the social media presence of zoos needs to really stay on point after this COVID um, lockdown has truly eased so that we can reach as many of those people as possible. Seems to be a really good point in which to wind this um, panel discussion up. And um, I really want to thank everybody for their participation, but also give Lou a great big shout out for organising the IT to host all of this. So well done, Lou. Um, and Paul, can I hand, hand over to you now to draw the conference to a formal close? Yeah, I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Lisa and Lou, for this uh, panel discussion and for the Biaza office for lending the support as well. I mean, we were really struggling to work out a platform that was going to house this many people that wanted to get involved. Um, and for everyone that's posted uh, in the comments about um, how do I get into zoo science? How do I get into zoo research? What do I have to do? What experience can I get? Go and bug a friendly academic because we don't bite come along prepared with questions that are going to be sensible for us to answer and think about what you want to do and think about the types of question or species that you're interested in. Um, any researcher, any scientist wants help with their data collection and the methods that they need to implement to, to get their work out there. So if you can show that you're willing and able and you're keen to do something really, really well, then you're going to find people will open doors for you and give you the experiences. Um, that will help you build your CV to one day get to where you want to go in the zoo world. Um, and this, I think, has been a really nice way of engaging with as many people as possible. And I know that Lou has been collecting facts and figures on how many people have been engaging with the talks throughout the day. But I've just been beavering away on the Facebook page in the background uh, whilst this has been going on. And <laughs> one of our talks today has had a reach of over 62,000 people. So I don't know how many times that has gone around the world, but I'm gonna say quite a few. So I think we have mentioned the bad points of social media, 
and how it can be frustrating and how you need to change your messaging. But I also think that's a really nice point to, to leave on with how good social media can be as well and how we have embraced a carbon free, carbon neutral, whatever it's called, sustainable conference um, and ultimately increased our engagement with many people that might not always have been able to come to one of these events that we've housed in person. That's not mean that we won't do them in person in the future, but I think it's evolution and not revolution. So this might be something that we do more frequently as the years go on. But thank you to everybody that has spoken and thank you to everybody that has um, participated. It's been a really good day. Uh, thanks for everyone for joining. I can still see there's 70 people who are um, actively listening. So thanks to those as well. And thank you, Paul, as the final point, because you have um, spearheaded this. I know Sam Warden and, and Lou Bell um, came up with the idea and said, hey, can we really try this? But um, Paul, you've really capitalised upon it and really organised for everybody. So thank you as well for all of your hard work. You're welcome. And just to reiterate, it's all on the Facebook page for free forever. <laughs> <laughs> so watch it whenever you like. <laughs> Thanks, folks. Have a good evening. <laughs>